How Money Works. Money is the invisible hand that shapes our world. Let's dive into the history, mechanics, and future of how money works. Money is only a tool. It will take you wherever you wish, but it will not replace you as the driver. Ayn Rand. This episode is fairly extensive. There is some overlapping information depending on the topic covered, but hey, they do say that repetition aids learning. Money is a fundamental part of our global society, influencing economies, policies, and personal lives. Money is essentially a tool that allows us to exchange goods and services without having to barter or trade one item directly for another. It serves three main functions. A, medium of exchange. Money is used to buy and sell goods and services, making transactions easier and more efficient than bartering. B, unit of account. Money provides a standard way to measure and compare the value of different goods and services, enabling us to set prices and keep financial records. C. Store of value. Money allows us to save and accumulate purchasing power over time so we can buy things in the future rather than having to spend everything we earn immediately. By understanding these basic functions of money, we can better appreciate its importance in our daily lives and the global economy. From the barter systems of ancient civilizations to the rise of cryptocurrencies, the story of money is one of constant evolution. In this episode, we'll explore the origins of currency, the inner workings of modern banking and monetary systems, and the revolutionary potential of blockchain technology and digital currencies. We'll delve into the history of money, tracing its development from commodity-based forms like gold and silver to the fiat currency systems we know today. Throughout history, money has taken different forms. In the past, people often used commodities, such as gold or silver, as money. These are called commodity-based money because their value comes from the inherent worth of the commodity itself. For example, if you had a gold coin, you could use it to buy things because the gold had value on its own. However, carrying around large amounts of gold or silver was inconvenient and risky. Over time, governments started issuing paper money, which is called fiat currency. Fiat currency is not backed by a physical commodity like gold, but instead gets its value from the government's declaration that it is legal tender. In other words, fiat money has value because the government says it does and because people trust that it will be accepted as payment. Today, most countries use fiat currencies, such as the US dollar, the euro, or the Japanese yen. These currencies are not inherently valuable like gold, but they are widely accepted and trusted for making transactions and storing value. We'll examine the mechanics of fractional reserve banking and the role of central banks like the Federal Reserve in influencing the money supply and managing economic stability. Fractional reserve banking is a system where banks only keep a fraction of the money that people deposit with them in their reserves. The rest of the money is lent out to other people or businesses, which can then be deposited into other banks, creating even more money in the economy. Here's a simple example. Imagine you deposit $100 into your bank account. The bank is required to keep a fraction of that deposit, say 10% in its reserves. This means the bank keeps $10 and can lend out the remaining $90 to someone else. When that person deposits the $90 into another bank, that bank can keep 10%, $9, and lend out the rest, $81. This process continues, with each new loan creating more money in the economy. Central banks, like the Federal Reserve in the United States, play a crucial role in this system by setting the reserve requirements, the fraction of deposits that banks must keep in their reserves, and influencing interest rates. By changing these factors, central banks can control how much money is created through fractional reserve banking and, in turn, influence economic growth and stability. For example, if the Federal Reserve lowers interest rates, it becomes cheaper for people and businesses to borrow money, which can stimulate spending and economic growth. On the other hand, if the Federal Reserve raises interest rates, borrowing becomes more expensive, which can slow down economic growth and help control inflation. As we navigate the complexities of the global financial landscape, we'll also address critical issues such as wealth inequality, inflation, and the impact of corporate practices on wage stagnation. We'll explore alternative investment strategies, including index funds, socially responsible investing, and the growing realm of decentralized finance, DeFi. Furthermore, 
will shed light on the rise of cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum, the underlying blockchain technology, and the potential disruption they bring to traditional financial systems. Cryptocurrencies, such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, are digital or virtual currencies that use cryptography, complex mathematical algorithms, for security. Unlike traditional fiat currencies, cryptocurrencies are decentralized, meaning they are not controlled by any government or central bank. Instead, cryptocurrencies operate on a technology called blockchain, which is essentially a digital ledger that records all transactions across a network of computers. When someone makes a transaction using a cryptocurrency, the details of that transaction are verified by the network and added to the blockchain, creating a permanent and transparent record. This ensures that no one person or group can defraud the record. Blockchain is a decentralized, distributed ledger technology that records transactions across a network of computers. Each block in the chain contains a number of transactions, and every time a new transaction occurs on the network, it is recorded in a block. Once a block is filled with transactions, it is linked to the previous block, creating a chain of blocks, hence the name blockchain. Here's a step-by-step -step example of how a cryptocurrency transaction works using blockchain. One, let's say Alice wants to send one Bitcoin, BTC, to Bob. Alice initiates the transaction using her digital wallet, which contains her private key, a secure, unique code that allows her to access her cryptocurrencies. Two, the transaction details, including Alice's public key, a unique identifier derived from her private key, Bob's public key, and the amount, one BTC, are broadcast to the entire Bitcoin network. Three, network nodes, computers connected to the network, validate the transaction by checking if Alice has enough BTC in her account and if the transaction follows the network's rules. Four, once the transaction is verified, it is combined with other pending transactions into a new block. Each block contains a unique code called a hash, which is derived from the transactions within the block and the hash of the previous block. Five, miners, powerful computers on the network, compete to solve a complex mathematical problem to add the new block to the blockchain. This process, called proof of work, ensures that adding blocks to the chain is difficult and requires substantial computational power, preventing fraudulent activities. Six, the first miner to solve the problem broadcasts the solution to the network. Other nodes verify the solution, and if correct, the new block is added to the blockchain. Seven, once the block containing Alice's transaction to Bob is added to the blockchain, the transaction is complete and Bob receives one BTC in his digital wallet. The beauty of blockchain technology is that every transaction is recorded in a transparent, immutable, and tamper-proof way. If someone tries to alter a transaction in a previous block, the hash of that block would change and the subsequent blocks would no longer be valid, as their hashes are derived from the previous block's hashes. This makes it extremely difficult, if not impossible, to fraudulently alter the transaction history without being detected by the network. Moreover, since the blockchain is maintained by a decentralized network of nodes rather than a single central authority, it is highly resistant to tampering, hacking, and fraud. This transparency and security are what make blockchain technology so appealing for various applications, including cryptocurrencies, supply chain management, and voting systems. One of the main advantages of cryptocurrencies is that they allow for fast, secure, and low-cost transactions without the need for intermediaries like banks. For example, if you wanted to send money to someone in another country using traditional methods, it could take several days and involve high fees. With cryptocurrencies, you can send money almost instantly and with much lower fees, even as low as one cent, depending on the method used. However, cryptocurrencies also come with risks, such as high volatility, rapid changes in value, potential for fraud or hacking, and lack of regulation. As more people and businesses start using cryptocurrencies, they have the potential to disrupt traditional financial systems and change the way we think about money. It's important to note that while cryptocurrencies are often used as a form of investment or speculation, their original purpose was to serve as a decentralized means of exchange for goods and services. We'll discuss the concept of central bank digital currencies, CBDCs, and the regulatory challenges surrounding digital assets. 
Central bank digital currencies, CBDCs, are digital versions of a country's fiat currency issued and backed by the central bank. Unlike cryptocurrencies, which are decentralized and operate independently of governments, CBDCs are centralized and represent a digital form of a country's official currency. The main difference between CBDCs and cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin is that CBDCs are issued and controlled by central banks, while cryptocurrencies are created and managed by decentralized networks of users. This means that CBDCs are subject to the same monetary policies and regulations as traditional fiat currencies, providing greater stability and trust. For example, if the Federal Reserve were to issue a digital US dollar, a CBDC, it would have the same value as a physical dollar and could be used for everyday transactions just in a digital form. The Federal Reserve would be able to control the supply and circulation of the digital dollars, just as it does with physical cash. The introduction of CBDCs raises important questions about privacy, security, and the role of traditional banks in a digital currency ecosystem. As central banks around the world explore the potential benefits and risks of CBDCs, they must also navigate complex regulatory challenges to ensure that these new digital currencies are safe, reliable, and accessible to all. In summary, while cryptocurrencies and CBDCs are both forms of digital money, they differ in terms of their issuance, management, and regulatory oversight. Understanding these differences is crucial for navigating the rapidly evolving world of digital assets and their potential impact on the global financial system. Throughout our journey, we'll emphasize the importance of financial literacy, personal finance management, and the psychological factors that influence our relationship with money. By understanding the past, present, and future of money, we can better navigate the ever-evolving financial tides and make informed decisions about our economic well-being. Join us as we embark on this insightful exploration of how money works and gain a deeper appreciation for the invisible force that shapes our world. Section 1. The History of Money Origins from Bartering to Currency The origins of money can be traced back to the earliest civilizations, where barter systems involving the direct exchange of goods and services were prevalent. However, the limitations of bartering soon became apparent, as finding a mutual coincidence of wants, two parties desiring each other's goods or services at the same time, was often challenging. This gave rise to the concept of money as a medium of exchange. Certain commodities, such as salt, cattle, and shells, were used as primitive forms of currency due to their durability, portability, and divisibility. As societies grew more complex, precious metals like gold and silver became widely accepted mediums of exchange, laying the foundation for commodity money. The use of commodity money, however, had its own drawbacks. The inherent value of the metals made them susceptible to hoarding and speculation, limiting their effectiveness as a means of exchange. This paved the way for the development of representative money, where paper certificates or coins represented a claim on a specific amount of a commodity, typically gold or silver. Over time, governments began issuing fiat money currency that derives its value not from any intrinsic commodity, but from the confidence and trust placed in the issuing authority. This transition marked a significant shift as the value of fiat money was no longer tied to a physical commodity, but rather to the stability of the issuing government and the strength of the underlying economy. The evolution of money from barter systems to commodity-based currencies, and eventually to fiat money, was a gradual process that spanned centuries. Each step in this progression aimed to address the limitations of the preceding system, facilitating more efficient trade, economic growth, and the management of monetary policies by central authorities. As we explore the complexities of modern monetary systems, it is essential to understand the historical context from which our current financial frameworks emerged. The journey from bartering to currency laid the groundwork for the intricate global financial landscape we navigate today. Bartering and its limitations. Bartering involves the direct exchange of goods or services without the use of money. It was one of the earliest forms of trade practiced by ancient societies before the emergence of currency systems. In a barter economy, individuals would exchange items or skills they had for items or skills they needed or wanted. For example, a farmer could trade a basket of crops for a potter's ceramic goods, or a hunter could exchange animal pelts for a blacksmith's tools. 
This direct exchange allowed people to obtain desired goods or services without requiring a common medium of exchange. While bartering facilitated trade in primitive economies, it had several significant limitations. 1. Double coincidence of wants. For a barter transaction to occur, both parties had to mutually desire each other's goods or services at the same time. Finding this double coincidence of wants was often difficult, hindering the ability to obtain desired items efficiently. 2. Indivisibility of goods. Certain goods, like livestock or tools, were difficult to divide into smaller units, making it challenging to achieve an equal exchange when the items being traded had different values. 3. Lack of common measure of value. Without a standardized unit of account, it was problematic to determine the relative values of dissimilar goods, complicating the exchange process. 4. Inability to store value. Many bartered goods, such as perishable items like food, could not be easily stored or held as a store of value for future transactions. 5. Limited mobility. Bulky or heavy items were difficult to transport, restricting the geographic reach of barter trade. These limitations made bartering increasingly impractical as economies became more complex and specialized. The need for a more efficient medium of exchange that could overcome these constraints led to the development of commodity and fiat money systems, which facilitated trade and economic growth on a larger scale. The emergence of money as a medium of exchange. As economies grew and trade expanded beyond local communities, the limitations of barter systems became increasingly apparent. The need for a more efficient means of facilitating transactions led to the emergence of money as a widely accepted medium of exchange. The earliest forms of money were commodities that possessed intrinsic value, such as salt, spices, shells, and livestock. These items were widely desired, durable, and easily transportable, making them suitable for use as a medium of exchange. Over time, precious metals like gold, silver, and bronze gained prominence as commodity money due to their scarcity, divisibility, and durability. The use of commodity money addressed several limitations of bartering. 1. Universal acceptability. Unlike bartered goods, which had subjective values, commodity money was widely accepted and recognized as a medium of exchange, facilitating trade among diverse parties. 2. Divisibility. Precious metals could be divided into smaller units, allowing for more precise valuations and easier exchange of goods with different values. 3. Portability. Compared to bulky goods, commodity money was relatively lightweight and easy to transport, enabling long-distance trade and commerce. 4. Durability. Metals like gold and silver did not deteriorate or spoil over time, making them suitable for storing value. 5. Scarcity. The limited supply of precious metals ensured they maintained their value and could serve as a reliable store of wealth. As civilizations advanced and trade routes expanded, the use of commodity money facilitated economic growth and the integration of regional economies. However, the inherent value of commodity money also made it susceptible to hoarding and speculation, leading to the development of representative money systems. The emergence of money as a medium of exchange marked a pivotal moment in human history, enabling more complex economic systems, specialization of labor, and the accumulation of capital. It laid the foundation for the sophisticated monetary and financial systems we have today. The Development of Currency Types The development of money as a medium of exchange evolved through distinct phases with each type of currency addressing the limitations of the previous form. Let's explore the progression from commodity money to representative money and eventually fiat money. Commodity money, gold, silver, etc. In the early stages, Money took the form of commodities with intrinsic value, such as gold, silver, salt, and shells. These items were durable, divisible, and relatively scarce, making them suitable for use as a medium of exchange. Gold and silver in particular became widely accepted as commodity money due to their malleability, portability, and resistance to corrosion. As Ferguson notes in The Ascent of Money, the use of gold and silver as money can be traced back to ancient civilizations like Lydia in modern-day Turkey, where the first coin currency was minted around 600 BCE. 
Commodity money facilitated long-distance trade and served as a store of value, but it also had drawbacks, such as the risk of hoarding and the difficulty of verifying purity and weight. Representative Money, Gold and Silver Certificates To address the challenges of transporting and safeguarding large quantities of precious metals, the concept of representative money emerged. This involved the issuance of paper certificates or tokens that represented a claim on a specific amount of a commodity, typically gold or silver. Martin's book, Money, the Unauthorized Biography, explains that these certificates were initially issued by goldsmiths, who would store people's gold and silver in their vaults, providing receipts that could be used for transactions. This system allowed for more convenient exchange while retaining the backing of precious metals. However, as the confidence in these certificates grew, they began to circulate as money themselves, eventually leading to the development of modern banknotes and the fractional reserve banking system. Fiat money, government-backed paper currency. The transition to fiat money, or currency that derives its value from the authority and trust in the issuing government, marked a significant shift in the evolution of money. Fiat money is not backed by any physical commodity, but rather by the strength of the issuing nation's economy and the faith that it will be accepted as a medium of exchange. As Mishkin explains in The Economics of Money, Banking, and Financial Markets, fiat money systems emerged as governments sought to gain control over the money supply and monetary policy. The abandonment of the gold standard by major economies in the 20th century, such as the United States in 1971, paved the way for modern fiat currency systems. While fiat money lacks intrinsic value, its acceptance is based on the credibility of the issuing authority and the stability of the underlying economic system. Central banks play a crucial role in managing the money supply, interest rates, and inflation to maintain confidence in fiat currencies. The development of currency types, from commodity money to representative money, and eventually fiat money, reflects the evolving needs of economies and the pursuit of more efficient and manageable monetary systems. Each step in this progression aimed to address the limitations of the previous form while facilitating trade, economic growth, and the management of monetary policies. Section 2. Modern Banking and Monetary Systems Fractional Reserve Banking At the heart of modern banking lies the concept of fractional reserve banking, a system that allows banks to lend out more money than they actually hold in reserves. This mechanism plays a crucial role in the creation of money and the expansion of the money supply within an economy. Explanation of how banks can lend out more than they hold. Commercial banks are required to hold a certain percentage of their deposits as reserves, either in physical cash or with the central bank. The remaining funds are available for lending purposes. When a bank receives a deposit, it keeps a fraction of that deposit as a reserve and lends out the rest to borrowers, such as individuals seeking mortgages or businesses seeking loans. As Mishkin explains in The Economics of Money, Banking, and Financial Markets, the fractional reserve system enables banks to create money through the lending process. When a bank issues a loan, it credits the borrower's account with the loan amount, effectively creating new money in the form of bank deposits. How this system creates money through loans. The money creation process is further amplified through the money multiplier effect. When a borrower spends the loan amount, that money is deposited into another bank, which can then lend out a portion of those funds, creating even more money in the form of new loans and deposits. This cycle repeats as the initial deposit circulates through the banking system, with each bank holding a fraction of the deposits as reserves and lending out the rest. As a result, the total amount of money in circulation within the economy can be a multiple of the initial deposit, facilitated by the fractional reserve system. The Federal Reserve Board's publication, The Federal Reserve System, Purposes and Functions, explains that this process allows banks to collectively lend out more funds than they hold in reserves, effectively creating money through the lending process. However, this system also carries risks. If too many depositors attempt to withdraw their funds simultaneously, a bank may not have sufficient reserves to meet the demand, potentially leading to bank runs and financial instability. Regulatory measures, such as reserve requirements and deposit insurance, aim to mitigate these risks and maintain public confidence in the banking system. The fractional reserve banking system is a fundamental component of modern monetary systems, enabling the efficient allocation of capital and the expansion of credit within an economy.
Understanding how this system creates money through the lending process is crucial for comprehending the dynamics of money supply and the role of banks in facilitating economic growth. The Federal Reserve System The Federal Reserve, often referred to as the Fed, is the central banking system of the United States. It plays a vital role in shaping the country's monetary policy and ensuring the stability of the financial system. History and structure, the Federal Reserve, was established in 1913 after a series of banking panics exposed the need for a central monetary authority. It is structured as a network of 12 regional Federal Reserve banks coordinated by the Federal Reserve Board in Washington, D.C. This decentralized structure was designed to ensure representation from various regions and economic sectors. Clarification, not a government system. It's important to clarify that the Federal Reserve is an independent entity within the government, not a direct part of the executive, legislative, or judicial branches. As Mishkin notes in The Economics of Money, Banking, and Financial Markets, the Fed's independence allows it to make monetary policy decisions without undue political influence, promoting long-term economic stability. Purpose and Functions the primary purposes of the Federal Reserve, as outlined in the Federal Reserve Act, are to maintain the stability of the financial system, contain systemic risks, and conduct monetary policy to support maximum employment, stable prices, and moderate long-term interest rates. Key functions of the Fed include 1. Monetary Policy The Federal Open Market Committee, FOMC, sets target ranges for key interest rates, influencing the availability and cost of credit within the economy. 2. Bank Supervision The Fed oversees and regulates banking institutions to ensure the safety and soundness of the financial system. 3. Payment Systems The Fed facilitates the smooth operation of payment and settlement systems, enabling the efficient transfer of funds between banks and other institutions. 4. Lender of Last Resort in times of financial stress, the Fed can provide emergency lending to banks and other entities to prevent systemic crises. How the U.S. borrows from the Federal Reserve While the Federal Reserve is an independent entity, it has a unique relationship with the U.S. government. The government borrows money by issuing treasury securities, which the Fed can purchase on the open market. This process, known as monetizing the debt, effectively creates new money and expands the money supply. Impact of Monetary Policy The Federal Reserve's monetary policy decisions have far-reaching impacts on the economy. By adjusting interest rates and regulating the money supply, the Fed can influence economic growth, employment levels, and inflation rates. Expansionary policies, such as lowering interest rates, aim to stimulate economic activity, while contractionary policies aim to cool an overheated economy and curb inflation. In his book, The Business Blockchain, William Mugayar emphasizes the importance of the Federal Reserve's credibility and communication in shaping market expectations, stating, The Fed's words and actions are closely watched by markets, and its policy moves can have profound effects on asset prices and the overall economy. The Federal Reserve System plays a critical role in the modern banking and monetary landscape, acting as the guardian of financial stability and the conductor of monetary policy. Understanding its structure, functions, and the implications of its actions is essential for comprehending the intricate workings of the U.S. financial system and its impact on the broader economy. Let's delve deeper into these aspects, structure and governance. The Federal Reserve System comprises the Board of Governors, the Federal Open Market Committee, FOMC, and 12 regional Federal Reserve Banks. The Board of Governors, appointed by the President and confirmed by the Senate, oversees the Fed's operations and formulates monetary policy. The FOMC, consisting of the Board of Governors and Presidents of the Regional Fed Banks, makes key decisions regarding the implementation of monetary policy. This decentralized structure ensures that the Fed considers diverse economic perspectives from various regions, promoting a more holistic approach to decision-making. However, it also introduces the potential for internal debates and differing views, which can impact policy outcomes. Functions and Tools The Federal Reserve wields a powerful set of tools to influence the economy and achieve its dual mandate of price stability and maximum employment. These tools include 1. Open Market Operations the Fed buys or sells government securities to adjust the money supply and influence interest rates, with purchases increasing the money supply and sales decreasing it. 
two, reserve requirements. Setting the amount of reserves banks must hold against their deposits affects their ability to lend and create money. Three, discount rate. The interest rate charged by the Fed on loans to banks influencing the cost of borrowing and the availability of credit. Four, forward guidance. Clear communication about the Fed's future policy intentions, shaping market expectations, and influencing long-term interest rates. The effective use of these tools requires careful analysis of economic indicators, forecasting, and a deep understanding of the complex interplay between monetary policy, financial markets, and the real economy. Implications and Impact The Federal Reserve's actions have far-reaching implications for various sectors and stakeholders within the U.S. economy and beyond. 1. Financial markets, interest rate decisions, and forward guidance directly impact stock, bond, and currency markets, influencing asset prices, borrowing costs, and investment behavior. 2. Banking industry. Changes in reserve requirements and the discount rate affect banks' lending capacity, profitability, and the availability of credit for consumers and businesses. 3. Inflation and employment. The Fed's efforts to maintain price stability and promote maximum employment through monetary policy have direct consequences for household budgets, wage growth, and overall economic stability. 4. International Implications As the world's largest economy, the Fed's policies can significantly impact global financial markets, trade flows, and the relative strength of the U.S. dollar. The Federal Reserve's actions also have distributional consequences, with different groups potentially benefiting or bearing the brunt of policy decisions. For instance, low interest rates may stimulate economic growth, but erode the purchasing power of fixed income earners and savers. Given the Federal Reserve's pivotal role in shaping the U.S. financial landscape and its ripple effects on the global economy, it is crucial for policymakers, businesses, investors, and the general public to closely monitor and understand the Fed's actions and their potential implications. Section 3. The History of Digital Money As the world became increasingly digitized, the concept of electronic money, or digital currency, began to emerge. While physical cash and traditional banking systems have dominated for centuries, the rise of the internet and advancements in cryptography paved the way for new forms of digital money. Early Concepts and Electronic Money DigiCash, 1989 One of the earliest pioneers in the realm of digital cash was David Chaum, a respected cryptographer. In 1989, Chaum founded DigiCash, a company that developed an electronic cash system aimed at preserving anonymity and privacy in digital transactions. DigiCash's technology involved the use of cryptographic protocols and blind digital signatures, allowing users to make secure and untraceable payments. While innovative, the system faced challenges in gaining widespread adoption and eventually declared bankruptcy in 1998. eGold, 1996 Launched in 1996, eGold was an early attempt at creating a digital currency backed by precious metals. The system allowed users to purchase and trade digital units of e-gold, each representing a specific amount of physical gold bullion held in reserves. E-gold gained some traction, particularly in the online gaming and digital goods markets. However, it faced legal challenges due to concerns over money laundering and lack of regulatory oversight, eventually leading to its closure by the U.S. government in 2008. PayPal, 1998 while not a digital currency itself, PayPal's introduction in 1998 marked a significant step in facilitating online payments and digital transactions. Originally designed to enable secure money transfers between Palm Pilot devices, PayPal quickly evolved into a widely adopted platform for e-commerce payments. PayPal's success lies in its ability to provide a user-friendly and secure way for individuals and businesses to send and receive payments electronically, bridging the gap between traditional banking systems and the online world. Liberty Reserve, 2006. Liberty Reserve was a digital currency service that operated from 2006 until it shut down by authorities in 2013. It allowed users to transfer funds anonymously and maintain balances in various currencies, including its own internal currency, the Liberty Reserve Dollar. 
While initially popular, especially in regions with underdeveloped banking systems, Liberty Reserve faced allegations of facilitating money laundering and other illegal activities. Authorities seized the company's assets, and its founders were ultimately convicted of operating an unlicensed money-transmitting business. These early ventures into digital money and electronic payment systems laid the groundwork for the eventual emergence of cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology. While some of these initiatives faced challenges or fell into legal troubles, they demonstrated the growing demand for alternative forms of digital money and paved the way for more decentralized and secure systems. The Rise of Cryptocurrencies Building upon the early foundations of digital money, the advent of cryptocurrencies marked a significant shift in the landscape of digital assets. Cryptocurrencies, such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, leverage blockchain technology and cryptography to create decentralized, secure, and transparent systems for digital transactions. Bitcoin, 2008. In 2008, an individual or group using the pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto released a white paper titled Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. The paper outlined a revolutionary concept for a decentralized digital currency that could operate without the need for intermediaries like banks or governments. Bitcoin's underlying technology, the blockchain, is a distributed ledger that records transactions across a network of computers. This decentralized structure ensures transparency, security, and immutability of transactions. Bitcoin supply is algorithmically limited to 21 million coins, creating scarcity and potential value appreciation. Initial adoption and growth. In the early years of Bitcoin, adoption was primarily driven by tech enthusiasts, libertarians, and those seeking alternative financial systems. One notable early adopter was Laszlo Hanyetz, who made the first documented purchase using Bitcoin in 2010, famously buying two pizzas for 10,000 BTC, worth millions of dollars today. As Bitcoin gained traction, it also attracted attention from illicit markets, such as the infamous Silk Road, an online black market platform. While this association with illegal activities initially tainted Bitcoin's reputation, it also highlighted the potential for pseudonymous transactions and the need for regulatory frameworks. Altcoins and Ethereum, 2013 to 2015. As Bitcoin's popularity grew, developers began creating alternative cryptocurrencies or altcoins with various features and use cases. Litecoin, created in 2011, aimed to be a faster and more scalable version of Bitcoin. Ripple, launched in 2012, focused on facilitating cross-border payments for financial institutions. In 2015, Ethereum emerged as a groundbreaking platform that introduced smart contracts, self-executing contracts with the terms directly written into code. Ethereum's native cryptocurrency, Ether, ETH, fueled the network and enabled the creation of decentralized applications, dApps, and tokens. Initial Coin Offerings, ICOs 2017 the proliferation of cryptocurrencies and the ease of launching new tokens led to the rise of initial coin offerings, ICOs, in 2017. ICOs allowed projects to raise funds by selling tokens to investors, often with the promise of future utility or value appreciation. However, the ICO boom also attracted fraudulent projects and scams, leading to increased scrutiny from regulatory bodies like the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC. This regulatory attention prompted a shift towards more compliant token offerings, such as security token offerings, STOs, and initial exchange offerings, IEOs. The rise of cryptocurrencies represents a significant milestone in the history of digital money. By leveraging blockchain technology and cryptographic principles, cryptocurrencies introduced a new paradigm for financial transactions challenging traditional banking systems and sparking a global conversation about the future of money. As cryptocurrencies continue to evolve and mature, they face ongoing challenges related to scalability, regulatory clarity, and mainstream adoption. Nevertheless, their impact on the financial landscape is undeniable, paving the way for further innovation in the realm of digital assets and decentralized finance. Mainstream Acceptance and Institutional Interest as cryptocurrencies gained traction and market capitalization, they began to attract the attention of mainstream institutions and investors. This growing institutional interest marked a significant shift in the perception and legitimacy of digital assets. 
Bitcoin Futures, 2017. In December of 2017, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, CME, and the Chicago Board Options Exchange, CBOE, launched regulated Bitcoin futures contracts. The introduction of these futures contracts allowed institutional investors to gain exposure to Bitcoin's price movements without directly holding the cryptocurrency. The launch of Bitcoin futures was a milestone moment as it provided a regulated and standardized way for institutions to participate in the cryptocurrency market. It also paved the way for the potential development of other cryptocurrency derivatives and investment vehicles. Facebook's Libra DM 2019 In June 2019, Facebook announced its ambitious plan to launch a global cryptocurrency called Libra, later renamed DM. The project aimed to create a stable digital currency backed by a basket of fiat currencies and government securities, with the goal of enabling fast and low-cost cross-border payments. Libra's white paper envisioned a permissioned blockchain governed by the Libra Association, consisting of major companies and organizations from various sectors. The announcement garnered significant global attention, with supporters praising its potential to promote financial inclusion and critics raising concerns about privacy, centralization, and regulatory compliance. The Libra project faced intense regulatory scrutiny and pushback from central banks and policymakers worldwide. Concerns were raised about Facebook's track record on data privacy, the potential for money laundering and terrorist financing, and the implications for monetary sovereignty. In response to the regulatory challenges, several key members of the Libra Association, including PayPal, MasterCard, and Visa, withdrew from the project. Facebook eventually rebranded the project as DM and scaled back its ambitions, focusing on creating a more limited stablecoin tied to the US dollar. Institutional Adoption 2020 to Present The years following the Bitcoin futures launch and the Libra announcement saw a surge in institutional adoption of cryptocurrencies. Major corporations, such as MicroStrategy and Tesla, began adding Bitcoin to their balance sheets as a reserve asset. MicroStrategy, a business intelligence software company, made headlines in 2020 when it announced a $250 million investment in Bitcoin as part of its capital allocation strategy. The company continued to accumulate Bitcoin, holding over 90,000 BTC as of early 2021. In February 2021, Tesla revealed a $1.5 billion Bitcoin purchase and announced plans to accept Bitcoin as payment for its products. This move by a major corporation further legitimized Bitcoin's status as a mainstream financial asset. Financial institutions also began to offer cryptocurrency investment products and services to their clients. Grayscale Investments, a digital asset management firm, saw its Bitcoin Trust, GBTC, become a popular investment vehicle for institutional investors seeking exposure to Bitcoin. In addition, major banks and financial service providers, such as Fidelity, started offering cryptocurrency custody and trading services, catering to the growing demand from institutional clients. The growing mainstream acceptance and institutional interest in cryptocurrencies mark a significant shift in the perception and adoption of digital assets. As more corporations and financial institutions embrace cryptocurrencies, the ecosystem continues to mature, driving innovation, and pushing for clearer regulatory frameworks. This increased institutional involvement has the potential to bring greater stability, liquidity, and credibility to the cryptocurrency market. However, it also raises questions about the centralization of power and the alignment with the original decentralized ethos of cryptocurrencies. Institutional adoption, 2020 to present. The period from 2020 onwards has seen a remarkable surge in institutional adoption of cryptocurrencies, particularly Bitcoin. Major corporations, financial institutions, and even governments have begun to recognize the potential of cryptocurrencies as a store of value, a hedge against inflation, and a means of diversifying their investment portfolios. Corporations adding Bitcoin to balance sheets. One of the most significant developments in institutional adoption has been the trend of corporations adding Bitcoin to their balance sheets. MicroStrategy, a prominent business intelligence software company, made headlines in August 2020 when it announced a $250 million investment in Bitcoin as part of its capital allocation strategy. The company's CEO, Michael Saylor, became a vocal advocate for Bitcoin, 
arguing that it represents a superior asset class for long-term value storage. Following MicroStrategy's lead, other major corporations began to follow suit. In February 2021, electric vehicle manufacturer Tesla revealed that it had purchased $1.5 billion worth of Bitcoin and announced plans to accept the cryptocurrency as payment for its products. This move by a company of Tesla's size and influence further legitimized Bitcoin's status as a mainstream financial asset. Other notable corporate adopters of Bitcoin include Square, a digital payments company, which invested $50 million in Bitcoin in October 2020 and later increased its holdings to $170 million. In addition, insurance giant MassMutual purchased $100 million worth of Bitcoin for its general investment account in December 2020. Financial Institutions Offering Crypto Investment Products Alongside corporate adoption, major financial institutions have begun to offer a range of cryptocurrency investment products to their clients. Fidelity Investments, one of the world's largest asset managers, has been at the forefront of this trend. In 2018, Fidelity launched a subsidiary called Fidelity Digital Assets, which provides cryptocurrency custody and trade execution services for institutional investors. In 2020, Fidelity announced the launch of its first Bitcoin fund, the Wise Origin Bitcoin Index Fund 1, which allows qualified investors to gain exposure to Bitcoin through a traditional investment vehicle. The fund has seen significant demand, reflecting the growing appetite for cryptocurrency investments among institutional clients. Other major financial players have also entered the cryptocurrency space. Grayscale Investments, a digital asset management firm, has seen its Bitcoin trust, GBTC, become a popular investment vehicle for institutional investors. As of March 2021, GBTC held over 655,000 BTC, worth approximately $38 billion. Investment banks like JP Morgan Chase and Goldman Sachs have also begun to offer cryptocurrency-related investment products to their clients, recognizing the growing demand for exposure to digital assets. El Salvador adopting Bitcoin as legal tender, 2021. Perhaps one of the most striking examples of institutional adoption came in June 2021, when El Salvador became the first country in the world to adopt Bitcoin as legal tender. The country's legislative assembly passed a law that requires businesses to accept Bitcoin as a form of payment alongside the U.S. dollar, which has been the country's official currency since 2001. The move by El Salvador, although controversial, represents a significant milestone in the mainstream acceptance of cryptocurrencies. The country's president, Nayib Bukele, has argued that adopting Bitcoin can help to promote financial inclusion, attract foreign investment, and reduce the cost of remittances, which account for a significant portion of El Salvador's GDP. The institutional adoption of cryptocurrencies, particularly Bitcoin, has been a game changer in terms of legitimizing digital assets and bringing them into the mainstream financial system. As more corporations, financial institutions, and governments embrace cryptocurrencies, the ecosystem is likely to continue to mature and evolve, paving the way for greater innovation and adoption in the years to come. However, this increased institutional involvement also raises questions about the centralization of power and the alignment with the original decentralized ethos of cryptocurrencies. As the space continues to develop, striking a balance between institutional participation and preserving the core principles of decentralization and financial empowerment will be a key challenge. Stablecoins and central bank digital currencies, CBDCs. As cryptocurrencies gain popularity, the need for more stable digital assets that could bridge the gap between traditional finance and the volatile crypto market became apparent. Stablecoins emerged as a solution, offering the benefits of cryptocurrencies while mitigating price volatility. In parallel, central banks began exploring the concept of CBDCs to digitize their national currencies. Stablecoins Stablecoins are cryptocurrencies designed to maintain a stable value relative to a reference asset, such as the US dollar or gold. They aim to combine the stability of fiat currencies with the digital nature and ease of transfer of cryptocurrencies. Tether, USDT, 2014, and USD Coin, USDC, 2018. Tether, USDT, launched in 2014, was one of the first and most widely adopted stablecoins. Pegged to the U.S. dollar at a one-to-one -one ratio, Tether aimed to provide a stable digital currency for traders and investors in the crypto market. 
However, Tether has faced controversy regarding the transparency of its reserve backing and has been subject to regulatory scrutiny. USD Coin, USDC, launched in 2018 by Circle and Coinbase, emerged as a more regulated and transparent alternative to Tether. USDC is also pegged to the US dollar and is backed by reserves held in regulated financial institutions. It has gained significant adoption, particularly in the decentralized finance, DeFi, ecosystem. Algorithmic stablecoins, for example, Terra USD, 2020. Algorithmic stablecoins, such as Terra USD, UST, attempt to maintain their peg to a reference asset through algorithms and smart contracts, rather than relying on collateral reserves. Terra USD, launched in 2020, used a complex mechanism involving a sister token, Luna, to maintain its peg to the US dollar. However, algorithmic stablecoins have faced challenges in maintaining their stability during market stress. In May 2022, Terra USD experienced a dramatic collapse, with its value falling significantly below its intended $1 peg. This event raised concerns about the stability and resilience of algorithmic stablecoins and sparked discussions about the need for improved regulation and oversight in the stablecoin market. Central Bank Digital Currencies CBDCs. CBDCs are digital versions of national currencies issued and backed by central banks. They aim to combine the efficiency and security of digital currencies with the trust and stability of central bank issued money. China's Digital Yuan Pilot 2020. China has been at the forefront of CBDC development with the People's Bank of China, PBOC, conducting extensive research and pilot projects. In 2020, China launched a large-scale pilot of its digital yuan, also known as the ECNY, in several cities. The pilot involved distributing digital yuan to citizens through lotteries and encouraging its use in retail transactions. China's digital yuan project aims to enhance financial inclusion, improve the efficiency of monetary policy transmission, and reduce the reliance on cash. It also has the potential to challenge the dominance of private payment platforms and increase the international use of the Chinese Yuan European Central Bank, ECB, exploring the digital euro. The European Central Bank has been actively exploring the concept of a digital euro. In October 2020, the ECB published a report on the potential issuance of a digital euro, outlining the benefits, challenges, and design considerations. The ECB has emphasized the importance of privacy, security, and accessibility in the development of a digital euro. In July 2021, the ECB launched a two-year investigation phase to further examine the feasibility and potential design of a digital euro. This phase involves engagement with stakeholders, prototyping, and testing to ensure that a digital euro meets the needs of European citizens and businesses. Federal Reserve, researching a potential U.S. digital dollar. The U.S. Federal Reserve has been researching the potential issuance of a digital dollar, also known as a central bank digital currency, CBDC. In 2020, the Federal Reserve published a paper outlining the potential benefits, risks, and design considerations for a U.S. CBDC. The Federal Reserve has emphasized the need for a thoughtful and deliberative approach to CBDC development, considering factors such as financial stability, privacy, and the role of the private sector. In 2021, the Federal Reserve announced the formation of a specialized team to further explore the potential for a digital dollar and engage with stakeholders on the topic. The rise of stablecoins and the exploration of CBDCs reflect the growing recognition of the potential for digital currencies to transform the financial landscape. Stablecoins offer a bridge between traditional finance and the crypto ecosystem, providing stability and facilitating digital transactions. CBDCs, on the other hand, represent a significant shift in the way central banks issue and manage money, with the potential to enhance financial inclusion, increase the efficiency of monetary policy, and promote innovation in the digital economy. However, both stablecoins and CBDCs also raise important questions about privacy, security, and the role of the private sector in the digital currency space. As these developments continue to unfold, striking the right balance between innovation, stability, and public interest will be crucial in shaping the future of digital currencies. Decentralized Finance, DeFi, and Web3, 2020 to present. 
The emergence of decentralized finance, DeFi, and the concept of Web3 have revolutionized the cryptocurrency and blockchain space in recent years. DeFi aims to create an open, transparent, and permissionless financial ecosystem, while Web3 represents a vision for a decentralized, user-centric internet. Together, these developments have sparked a new wave of innovation and investment in the blockchain industry. DeFi Protocols DeFi protocols are decentralized applications, dApps, built on blockchain networks, primarily Ethereum, that enable users to access a wide range of financial services without relying on traditional intermediaries such as banks or centralized exchanges. Uniswap, 2018, Compound, 2018, and Aave, 2017. Uniswap, launched in 2018, is a decentralized exchange, DX, protocol that allows users to trade cryptocurrencies directly from their wallets. It utilizes an automated market maker, AMM model, where liquidity providers contribute tokens to liquidity pools, enabling seamless and permissionless trading. Compound, also launched in 2018, is a decentralized lending and borrowing protocol. It enables users to earn interest on their deposited cryptocurrencies or borrow assets by providing collateral. Compound introduced the concept of yield farming, where users can earn additional rewards in the form of comp tokens for providing liquidity to the protocol. Aave, launched in 2017 as ETHLAND and rebranded in 2018, is another prominent DeFi lending and borrowing protocol. It offers features such as flash loans, which allow users to borrow funds without collateral for short periods and stable interest rates through stablecoin integration. Yield farming and liquidity mining. Yield farming and liquidity mining have become popular investment strategies in the DeFi space. Yield farming involves users moving their funds between different DeFi protocols to maximize returns, taking advantage of high yield opportunities. Liquidity mining incentivizes users to provide liquidity to DeFi protocols in exchange for rewards in the form of the protocol's native tokens. These strategies have attracted significant capital to the DeFi ecosystem, with the total value locked TVL in DeFi protocols reaching over $100 billion in 2021. However, the high yields and rapid growth have also raised concerns about sustainability, risk management, and potential vulnerabilities in the DeFi ecosystem. Web3 Concepts Web3 represents a vision for a decentralized, user-centric internet, where users have greater control over their data, identity, and online interactions. It encompasses various blockchain-based technologies and concepts that aim to challenge the dominance of centralized platforms and services. Non-Fungible Tokens, NFTs, Boom Non-Fungible Tokens, NFTs, are unique digital assets that represent ownership of a specific item, such as digital art, collectibles, or virtual real estate. NFTs are stored on blockchain networks, ensuring their authenticity, provenance, and scarcity. The NFT market experienced a significant boom in 20 to 21 with high profile sales such as Beeple's Everydays, the first 5,000 days NFT selling for $69 million at Christie's Auction House. The NFT craze attracted mainstream attention with celebrities, artists, and brands entering the space. NFTs have the potential to revolutionize the creative industry, enabling artists to monetize their digital creations and providing collectors with verifiable ownership and scarcity. However, the NFT market has also faced criticism for its environmental impact, as the minting and trading of NFTs on Ethereum requires significant energy consumption. Decentralized Autonomous Organizations DAOs. Decentralized Autonomous Organizations DAOs, are decentralized entities governed by smart contracts and operated by a community of stakeholders. DAOs enable decentralized decision-making, resource allocation, and project management without the need for traditional hierarchical structures. Examples of DAOs include MakerDAO, which governs the DAI stablecoin, and Decentraland, a virtual world platform where users can buy, sell, and manage virtual land. DAOs have the potential to reshape organizational structures and enable more transparent, democratic, and efficient governance models. However, they also face challenges related to legal recognition, liability, and the effective coordination of large, decentralized communities. Metaverse and Blockchain-Based Gaming 
The concept of the metaverse, a shared virtual space where users can interact, create, and transact, has gained significant traction in recent years. Blockchain technology has emerged as a key enabler for the metaverse, providing the infrastructure for digital asset ownership, value transfer, and decentralized governance. Blockchain-based games, such as Axie Infinity and Decentraland, have attracted substantial investment and in user adoption. These games incorporate NFTs and cryptocurrencies, enabling players to own, trade, and monetize in-game assets. The intersection of gaming, NFTs, and the metaverse has the potential to create new economic opportunities, spark innovation in the gaming industry, and blur the lines between virtual and real-world experiences. The rise of DeFi and the emergence of Web3 concepts have transformed the blockchain and cryptocurrency landscape, opening up new avenues for financial inclusion, creative expression, and decentralized governance. As these technologies continue to evolve and mature, they have the potential to reshape various industries and challenge traditional power structures. However, the rapid growth and innovation in the DeFi and Web3 space have also raised concerns about regulatory compliance, consumer protection, and the environmental impact of blockchain technologies. Balancing the benefits of decentralization with the need for responsible innovation and sustainable development will be crucial in shaping the future of DeFi and Web3. Section 4. Mortgage Lending and the Home Buying Process Mortgage lending is a crucial aspect of the modern financial system, enabling individuals to purchase homes by borrowing money from banks or other financial institutions. The home buying process involves a complex interplay between buyers, sellers, banks, and the broader economic landscape. How Mortgages Work a mortgage is a loan used to purchase a property, with the property itself serving as collateral for the loan. The borrower, or mortgagor, agrees to repay the lender, or mortgagee, over a set period, typically 15 to 30 years, with regular payments that include both principal and interest. The Role of Banks in Home Buying Banks play a central role in the home buying process by providing mortgages to qualified borrowers. When a bank approves a mortgage application, it essentially creates new money by crediting the borrower's account with the loan amount. This money is then transferred to the seller's account, facilitating the purchase of the property. How banks create money by adding numbers to a system. The process of mortgage lending highlights how banks create money through the fractional reserve banking system. When a bank issues a mortgage, it does not necessarily have the full amount of money in its reserves. Instead, it creates new money by adding numbers to its balance sheet, effectively increasing the money supply. As Una McDonald explains in Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, turning the American dream into a nightmare, banks do not lend out deposits, but rather create credit by expanding their balance sheets. This process of money creation through lending is a key feature of modern banking and has significant implications for the broader economy interest, and principal payments. Mortgage payments typically consist of two components, interest and principal. Interest is the cost of borrowing money, while principal refers to the original loan amount. The proportion of interest and principal in each payment varies over the life of the loan, with interest making up a larger share of early payments. Explanation of why home loans have higher interest payments up front. Mortgage amortization schedules are designed so that early payments consist primarily of interest, with the proportion of principal gradually increasing over time. This structure front loads the interest payments, ensuring that the bank receives a significant portion of the total interest owed early in the loan term. The rationale behind this arrangement is that it reduces the bank's risk exposure. If a borrower defaults on a loan, the bank will have already collected a substantial amount of interest, mitigating potential losses. Additionally, the time value of money principal suggests that money received today is more valuable than money received in the future, incentivizing banks to prioritize early interest payments. How Banks Profit from Interest Over Time Banks generate profit from mortgages primarily through the interest charged on the loans. Over the life of a 30-year mortgage, the total amount paid in interest can be substantial, often exceeding the original loan amount. For example, on a $300,000 mortgage with a 3.5% interest rate, the total interest paid over 30 years would be approximately $184,968. This interest income is a significant source of revenue for banks and contributes to their overall profitability. 
The mortgage lending process and the home buying journey are complex and deeply intertwined with the broader financial system. Banks play a crucial role in this process by creating money through lending, enabling individuals to purchase homes, and generating profit through interest payments. However, as the 2008 financial crisis demonstrated, the mortgage market is not without risks. Subprime lending, predatory practices, and the securitization of mortgage debt can lead to instability and economic disruption. As Richard Bowen III discusses in Damage Control, how banks shaped mortgages and loans and how that has affected the economy, the pursuit of profit in the mortgage industry can sometimes come at the expense of economic stability and consumer well-being. Understanding the intricacies of mortgage lending and the home buying process is essential for individuals navigating the housing market and for policymakers seeking to promote sustainable and equitable home ownership. By recognizing the power of banks to create money through lending and the potential risks associated with mortgage market excesses, we can work towards a more stable and inclusive housing finance system. The Stock Market 1. Overview of the Stock Market Definition and Function the stock market is a platform that facilitates the buying and selling of shares in publicly traded companies. It serves as a crucial component of the global financial system, allowing individuals and institutions to invest in the equity of companies and participate in their growth and profitability. The primary function of the stock market is to enable companies to raise capital by issuing shares to the public. When a company decides to go public through an initial public offering, IPO, it offers a portion of its ownership in the form of shares to investors. The funds raised through the IPO can be used to finance expansion, research and development, or other strategic initiatives. Once a company is listed on a stock exchange, its shares can be traded among investors in the secondary market. The stock market provides liquidity, allowing shareholders to buy or sell their shares at prevailing market prices. This liquidity is essential for investors, as it enables them to convert their investments into cash when needed. Historical Context The origins of the modern stock market can be traced back to the Amsterdam Stock Exchange, established in 1602 by the Dutch East India Company. The Amsterdam Stock Exchange is considered the world's first formal stock exchange, where shares in the Dutch East India Company were traded. The development of major stock exchanges in the United States, such as the New York Stock Exchange, NYSE, and the NASDAQ, played a significant role in shaping the global financial landscape. The New York Stock Exchange, founded in 1792, is one of the oldest and largest stock exchanges in the world. It is known for its listing of blue-chip companies and its iconic trading floor on Wall Street. The NASDAQ, established in 1971, emerged as the world's first electronic stock market. It is known for its focus on technology companies and has been at the forefront of the digital revolution in stock trading. Over time, the methods of trading stocks have evolved significantly. In the early days, trading took place through open outcry, where traders would gather on the exchange floor and shout orders to one another. The system was gradually replaced by electronic trading, which allowed for faster execution, greater transparency, and increased accessibility for investors worldwide. Today, the vast majority of stock trading occurs electronically, with algorithms and high-frequency trading systems playing a significant role in market dynamics. The advent of online trading platforms has democratized access to the stock market, enabling individual investors to participate in the market from the comfort of their own homes. The stock market serves as a barometer of the broader economy reflecting investor sentiment and expectations about the future performance of listed companies. It plays a vital role in the allocation of capital, allowing companies to access the funds needed for growth and expansion. However, the stock market is not without its challenges and controversies. Critics argue that the focus on short-term profits and the pressure to meet quarterly earnings expectations can lead to myopic decision-making by corporate executives. The concentration of wealth and the widening gap between the rich and the poor have also been linked to the stock market's performance, raising questions about the equitable distribution of economic gains. Despite these concerns, the stock market remains a cornerstone of the modern financial system, providing a mechanism for companies to raise capital, investors to participate in economic growth, and the efficient allocation of resources in the economy. Understanding the historical context, functions, and evolving nature of the stock market is essential for navigating the complexities of the financial world and making informed investment decisions. 
2. Pros of the Stock Market The stock market offers several compelling advantages for investors, including the potential for wealth creation, liquidity, and accessibility, and portfolio diversification. Wealth Creation One of the primary benefits of investing in the stock market is the potential for long-term wealth creation. Historically, stocks have delivered higher returns compared to other asset classes, such as bonds or savings accounts, over extended periods. For example, the S&P 500, a widely followed index of 500 large U.S. companies, has generated an average annual return of approximately 10% over the past century. This means that an investment of $10,000 in the S&P 500 could grow to over $1.7 million in 50 years, assuming an average annual return of 10% and not accounting for inflation or taxes. While past performance does not guarantee future results, the historical data suggests that patient, long-term investors who can ride out short-term market fluctuations have the potential to build significant wealth through stock market investments. Liquidity and Accessibility Another advantage of the stock market is its liquidity, which refers to the ease with which shares can be bought or sold. When an investor owns shares of a publicly traded company, they can typically convert those shares into cash relatively quickly by selling them on the stock exchange. This liquidity is important for investors who may need to access their funds for various reasons, such as emergencies, major purchases, or portfolio rebalancing. It allows investors to manage their financial needs while still participating in the long-term growth potential of the stock market. In addition to liquidity, the stock market offers accessibility to a wide range of investors. With the advent of online brokerages and trading platforms, individuals can easily open brokerage accounts and start investing with relatively small amounts of money. This accessibility has democratized investing, allowing more people to participate in the market and potentially benefit from its wealth building potential. Portfolio Diversification the stock market provides investors with ample opportunities for portfolio diversification, which is a key strategy for managing risk. Diversification involves spreading investments across different sectors, industries, and even geographical regions to mitigate the impact of any single investment's performance on the overall portfolio. By investing in a variety of stocks, investors can potentially reduce their exposure to company-specific risks and benefit from the growth of different sectors and industries. For example, an investor might allocate a portion of their portfolio to technology stocks, healthcare stocks, financial stocks, and consumer goods stocks, thereby diversifying their holdings and reducing the impact of any single company's performance. The stock market also offers access to international markets through instruments such as American Depository Receipts, ADRs, and Exchange Traded Funds, ETFs. ADRs are securities that represent ownership in the shares of a foreign company, but are traded on U.S. exchanges. ETFs are investment funds that hold a basket of stocks, bonds, or other assets and are traded on exchanges like individual stocks. By investing in ADRs and ETFs, investors can gain exposure to international markets and further diversify their portfolios, potentially benefiting from the growth of global economies and reducing the impact of domestic market fluctuations. The stock market's potential for wealth creation, liquidity, and accessibility and portfolio diversification make it an attractive option for many investors. However, it is essential to recognize that investing in the stock market also comes with risks, such as market volatility and the potential for short-term losses. Investors should carefully consider their financial goals, risk tolerance, and investment horizon before making decisions and seek the advice of financial professionals when needed. By understanding the pros and cons of the stock market and implementing a well-diversified investment strategy, investors can work towards achieving their long-term financial objectives while managing the inherent risks of investing. 3. Cons and Issues of the Stock Market While the stock market offers potential benefits, it also comes with significant drawbacks and challenges that investors must carefully consider. Volatility and Risk one of the primary cons of the stock market is its inherent volatility and risk. Stock prices can fluctuate significantly in response to a wide range of factors, such as economic conditions, political events, company performance, and market sentiment. Throughout history, the stock market has experienced numerous crashes and corrections, highlighting the potential for substantial losses. 
Notable examples include the dot-com bubble burst in the early 2000s, the 2008 financial crisis, and the COVID-19-induced market crash in 2020. During such events, investors can see the value of their portfolios decline sharply, leading to significant financial losses if they sell their holdings in a panic. While investing in a diversified portfolio of stocks, such as through index funds, can help mitigate some of the risks associated with individual stocks, it does not eliminate market risk entirely. Index funds, which track broad market indices like the S&P 500, provide exposure to a wide range of companies, but are still subject to overall market fluctuations. Corporate Practices and Shareholder Primacy Another concern surrounding the stock market is the focus on maximizing shareholder value and its impact on corporate practices. The emphasis on generating returns for shareholders can lead to short-term thinking and prioritization of profits over other stakeholders, such as employees and communities. One manifestation of this shareholder-centric approach is the prevalence of stock buybacks, where companies use their profits to repurchase their own shares, thereby boosting the value of the remaining shares. While buybacks can benefit shareholders, critics argue that they divert funds away from productive investments, such as research and development or employee compensation. Moreover, the focus on maximizing shareholder returns has been linked to wage stagnation and growing income inequality. Some argue that corporations have prioritized returning profits to shareholders through dividends and buybacks, rather than investing in their workforce and increasing wages in line with productivity gains. This dynamic can contribute to a widening gap between the wealthy, who often hold significant stock holdings, and the average worker. Unrealistic Expectations and Access Issues The stock market's potential for wealth creation can also lead to unrealistic expectations and access issues for many individuals. Not everyone has the financial means to invest meaningfully in the stock market. Low- and middle-income households may struggle to allocate sufficient funds to stock investments, especially if they are burdened with debt or lack access to affordable financial services. Additionally, many individuals rely heavily on employer-sponsored retirement plans, such as 401ks, for their stock market exposure. While these plans can be valuable tools for building retirement savings, they often come with limited investment options and can be subject to high fees eating into potential returns. Furthermore, financial literacy gaps can hinder effective investment strategies. Without a solid understanding of financial concepts, risk management, and market dynamics, individuals may make suboptimal investment decisions or fall prey to fraudulent schemes. Addressing these access and education issues is crucial to ensure that the benefits of the stock market are more widely distributed and that individuals can make informed decisions about their financial futures. The stock market, like any investment vehicle, comes with its own set of cons and challenges. Volatility and risk are inherent to the market, and investors must be prepared for the possibility of significant short-term losses. The focus on shareholder primacy and its impact on corporate practices and income inequality also raise important questions about the role of the stock market in shaping economic outcomes. Moreover, issues of access and financial literacy highlight the need for initiatives to promote financial inclusion and education, empowering more individuals to participate in the stock market and build long-term wealth. By understanding these cons and issues, investors can make more informed decisions, advocate for positive change, and work towards a more equitable and sustainable financial system. 4. Wage Stagnation and Shareholder Primacy the relationship between wage stagnation and the increasing focus on shareholder primacy in corporate governance has become a topic of significant concern in recent decades. Wage Stagnation Trends One of the most striking economic trends of the past half century has been the divergence between real wage growth and productivity growth. Since the 1970s, productivity has continued to rise steadily. But real wages, wages adjusted for inflation, have largely stagnated for many workers. This means that while workers are producing more output per hour, they are not seeing commensurate increases in their take-home pay. The gains from productivity growth have increasingly gone to the owners of capital, such as shareholders, rather than to the labor force. Moreover, there has been a shift in compensation structure, with a growing reliance on bonuses, stock options, and other forms of variable compensation particularly for executives and high-level employees. This has contributed to a widening gap between the highest earners and the average worker. 
shareholder primacy and corporate governance. The concept of shareholder primacy, which holds that the primary purpose of a corporation is to maximize value for its shareholders, has become a dominant force in corporate governance. This idea was famously articulated by economist Milton Friedman, who argued that the sole social responsibility of a business is to increase its profits within the rules of the game. Under this framework, companies are incentivized to prioritize actions that boost share prices and returns for investors, sometimes at the expense of other stakeholders, such as employees, customers, and communities. One manifestation of this shareholder-centric approach is the prevalence of stock buybacks. Instead of reinvesting profits into the company's operations, research and development, or employee compensation, many corporations have chosen to use their earnings to repurchase their own shares. By reducing the number of outstanding shares, buybacks can artificially inflate the value of the remaining shares, benefiting shareholders. However, critics argue that this focus on returning value to shareholders comes at the cost of underinvestment in the workforce, stagnating wages, and reduced job security. Impact on employees and society. The combination of wage stagnation and shareholder primacy has had significant consequences for employees and society as a whole. Growing income inequality has become a defining issue of our time, with the gap between the wealthy and the average worker widening significantly in recent decades. The erosion of middle-class wealth and the concentration of economic gains among the top earners have raised concerns about the long-term sustainability and fairness of the economic system. Moreover, the emphasis on cost-cutting and lean operations in the pursuit of higher shareholder returns has led to reduced job security for many workers. Layoffs, outsourcing, and the use of contract labor have become increasingly common, leaving employees vulnerable to economic shocks and making it harder to build stable careers. For those who do not have significant stock market investments, either due to lack of access or limited financial means, the wealth-building potential of the stock market remains out of reach. This can create a vicious cycle where wage stagnation makes it harder to invest and lack of investment exacerbates wealth disparities. Addressing the intertwined issues of wage stagnation and shareholder primacy will require a multifaceted approach. This may involve rethinking corporate governance models to prioritize stakeholder value over shareholder value implementing policies to promote wage growth and worker protections, and expanding access to financial education and investment opportunities. By recognizing the broader societal implications of wage stagnation and shareholder primacy, we can work towards building a more equitable and sustainable economic system that benefits a wider range of stakeholders. Five, alternative approaches to investment. While individual stock picking remains a popular investment strategy, there are several alternative approaches that investors can consider to diversify their portfolios, reduce risk, and align their investments with their values. Index Funds and ETFs Index funds and exchange-traded funds, ETFs, have gained significant popularity in recent years as a way for investors to gain broad exposure to the stock market with lower costs and less active management. Index funds are mutual funds that aim to track the performance of a specific market index, such as the S&P 500. By holding a diverse portfolio of stocks that mirrors the composition of the index, index funds provide investors with a simple way to achieve broad market exposure and diversification. Similarly, ETFs are investment funds traded on stock exchanges that often track an underlying index or sector. ETFs combine the diversification benefits of mutual funds with the liquidity and tradability of individual stocks. One of the main advantages of index funds and ETFs is their lower management fees compared to actively managed funds. By passively tracking an index rather than relying on the expertise of fund managers to pick individual stocks, these investment vehicles can keep costs low, allowing investors to keep more of their returns. Mutual funds and robo-advisors. For investors who prefer professional management and a more hands-off approach, mutual funds and robo-advisors offer alternative investment options. Mutual funds are professionally managed investment vehicles that pool money from multiple investors to purchase a diversified portfolio of stocks, bonds, or other securities. Investors buy shares in the fund and benefit from the collective performance of the underlying assets. 
Mutual funds come in various forms, including actively managed funds, where fund managers make decisions about buying and selling individual securities and passively managed funds, which aim to track an index. Actively managed funds typically charge higher fees than passively managed funds due to the added costs of research and expertise. Robo-advisors are a more recent innovation in the investment landscape. These digital platforms use algorithms and technology to provide automated portfolio management and investment advice to clients. By leveraging data and mathematical models, robo-advisors can create and manage diversified portfolios based on an investor's goals, risk tolerance, and time horizon. One of the main benefits of robo-advisors is their accessibility and lower fees compared to traditional financial advisors. By automating many of the processes involved in portfolio management, robo-advisors can offer services at a fraction of the cost of human advisors, making professional investment management more accessible to a broader range of investors. ESG Investing and Socially Responsible Investment, SRI, for investors who want to align their investments with their values and promote positive social and environmental outcomes, ESG investing and socially responsible investment, SRI, have emerged as popular alternatives. ESG investing involves considering environmental, social, and governance factors alongside traditional financial metrics when making investment decisions. This approach recognizes that a company's long-term success and sustainability are tied to its performance in areas such as carbon emissions, labor practices, diversity and inclusion, and corporate governance. Socially responsible investment takes this concept a step further by actively seeking out companies that demonstrate strong social and environmental responsibility and avoiding those engaged in harmful or unethical practices. The growth of ESG and SRI investing has led to the development of specialized ETFs and mutual funds that focus on companies with strong ESG profiles. These investment vehicles allow investors to support businesses that align with their values while still achieving their financial goals. As investors become more attuned to the broader societal impact of their investment choices, alternative approaches like index funds, ETFs, robo-advisors, and ESG investing offer ways to build diversified portfolios, reduce costs, and promote positive change. By considering these alternative investment strategies alongside traditional stock picking, investors can create a more robust and sustainable approach to wealth building and financial security. While the stock market can be a powerful tool for wealth creation, systemic issues like wage stagnation and inequality necessitate a more inclusive approach to investing. The stock market has played a crucial role in the global financial system, offering individuals and institutions the opportunity to participate in economic growth and build long-term wealth. The potential for attractive returns, liquidity, and diversification has made the stock market an appealing investment option for many. However, the stock market is not without its drawbacks and challenges. The inherent volatility and risk of market fluctuations can lead to significant short-term losses, requiring investors to have a long-term perspective and the ability to weather market downturns. Moreover, the increasing focus on shareholder primacy and the pursuit of short-term profits has contributed to a range of societal issues, including wage stagnation, income inequality, and reduced job security for workers. The disconnect between the stock market's performance and the economic reality faced by many individuals highlights the need for a more inclusive and equitable approach to investing in corporate governance. Actionable insights for listeners. One, understanding risk tolerance and investment goals. Before engaging with the stock market, it is crucial for individuals to assess their risk tolerance and define their investment goals. This involves considering factors such as age, income, financial obligations, and long-term aspirations. By aligning investment strategies with personal risk preferences and objectives, investors can make more informed decisions and avoid taking on excessive risk. Two, exploring employer-sponsored retirement plans and alternative investment strategies. Many individuals access the stock market through employer-sponsored retirement plans, such as 401ks, it is essential to understand the investment options available within these plans, including any matching contributions from employers, and to make the most of these opportunities for long-term wealth building. Additionally, exploring alternative investment approaches, such as index funds, ETFs, and ESG investing, can help investors diversify their portfolios, reduce costs, and align their investments with their values. 3. Emphasizing the importance of financial literacy. 
Investing in the stock market requires a foundation of financial knowledge and understanding. Emphasizing the importance of financial literacy, including basic concepts such as compound interest, diversification, and risk management, can empower individuals to make more informed investment decisions. Seeking out reliable sources of financial education, such as reputable books, courses, and professional advice, can help investors navigate the complexities of the stock market and avoid common pitfalls. To summarize, the stock market remains a powerful tool for wealth creation and economic growth, but it is not a panacea for the systemic issues facing our society. By recognizing the limitations and challenges of the stock market, and by promoting a more inclusive and equitable approach to investing, we can work towards a financial system that benefits a broader range of stakeholders. Empowering individuals with the knowledge, tools, and opportunities to participate in the stock market, while also advocating for corporate governance reforms and policies that promote shared prosperity, will be essential in building a more sustainable and just economic future. Section 5. Cryptocurrency and Blockchain Technology The emergence of cryptocurrency and blockchain technology has revolutionized the financial landscape, offering new possibilities for decentralized, secure, and transparent transactions. In this section, we'll explore the rise of cryptocurrency and how it challenges traditional banking systems. Rise of Cryptocurrency Overview of Bitcoin, Ethereum, and other major cryptocurrencies Bitcoin, the first and most well-known cryptocurrency, was introduced in 2008 by an anonymous person or group using the pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto. As described in the Bitcoin white paper, it is a decentralized digital currency that enables peer-to-peer -peer transactions without the need for intermediaries like banks. Bitcoin operates on a blockchain, a distributed ledger technology that records all transactions in a secure and transparent manner. Transactions are verified by a network of computers through a process called mining, which involves solving complex mathematical problems to validate and add new blocks to the chain. One minor downside of blockchain technology is, as the ledger of transactions grows, so does the blockchain. For example, as of this writing, to download the wallet and existing blockchain ledger to your computer for Bitcoin, you would need 572.38 gigabytes and counting. Allowing for continued growth since inception in 2008, that is an average of 98 megabytes of ledger data added per day. Following Bitcoin's success, numerous other cryptocurrencies, often referred to as altcoins, have emerged. Ethereum, launched in 2015, is the second largest cryptocurrency by market capitalization. Ethereum's blockchain introduces smart contract functionality, allowing developers to build decentralized applications, dApps, and execute self-enforcing contracts. Other notable cryptocurrencies include Litecoin, Ripple, XRP, Bitcoin Cash, and Cardano, each with its own unique features and use cases. Some cryptocurrencies focus on privacy and anonymity like Monero and Zcash, while others prioritize fast and low-cost transactions such as Stellar and Nano how they challenge traditional banking systems. Cryptocurrencies challenge traditional banking systems in several key ways. One, decentralization. Cryptocurrencies operate on decentralized networks, eliminating the need for central authorities like banks to control and validate transactions. This reduces the concentration of power and potential for single points of failure. Two, transparency and immutability. Blockchain technology ensures that all transactions are recorded in a transparent and immutable ledger accessible to anyone on the network. This level of transparency can help prevent fraud and increase accountability. 3. Peer-to-peer -peer transactions Cryptocurrencies enable direct peer-to-peer -peer transactions without the need for intermediaries, reducing transaction costs and increasing financial inclusion for those without access to traditional banking services. 4. Borderless and Fast Transactions Cryptocurrencies allow for fast and borderless transactions, enabling individuals to send and receive funds globally without the delays and fees associated with traditional cross-border payments. 5. Programmable Money Smart contract platforms like Ethereum introduce the concept of programmable money where funds can be automatically transferred or released based on predefined conditions, opening up new possibilities for financial innovation and automation. 
However, cryptocurrencies also face challenges and limitations. The decentralized nature of cryptocurrencies makes them more difficult to regulate, leading to concerns about their use for illegal activities such as money laundering and tax evasion. The volatility of cryptocurrency prices can also make them a risky investment, and the lack of consumer protections can leave users vulnerable to fraud and hacking. Despite these challenges, the rise of cryptocurrency represents a significant shift in the financial paradigm, offering new opportunities for financial inclusion, innovation, and decentralized economic systems. As the technology matures and regulatory frameworks evolve, cryptocurrencies have the potential to reshape the future of money and challenge the dominance of traditional banking systems. Blockchain technology, decentralized nature, and potential applications beyond currency. Blockchain technology, the underlying innovation behind cryptocurrencies, has far-reaching implications beyond its use in digital currencies. At its core, a blockchain is a decentralized, distributed ledger that records transactions in a secure, transparent, and immutable manner. The decentralized nature of blockchain technology means that no single entity controls the network. Instead, it relies on a consensus mechanism among participants to validate transactions and maintain the integrity of the ledger. This decentralization offers several benefits, such as increased resilience to attacks or failures, reduced reliance on intermediaries, and enhanced transparency. Imagine a giant, unbreakable, and transparent record book that everyone can see, but no one can change without others knowing. That's kind of like what a blockchain is, but instead of a physical book, it's a digital one spread across many computers. Now, let's say you want to buy a house, and the deed, the official ownership document, is stored on a blockchain. Here's how it would work. 1. The seller puts the deed on the blockchain, which creates a new entry or block in the digital record book. 2. This block contains all the important info about the deed, like the address, owner, and purchase price. 3. Once the block is added, it's linked to all the previous blocks forming a chain of records. That's why it's called a blockchain. 4. Now, when you buy the house, a new block is added to the chain showing that you're the new owner. 5. Everyone can see this new block, but no one can change it without everyone else knowing. The cool thing about blockchain is that it makes it really hard for anyone to cheat or secretly change the records. If someone tries to say they own the house, everyone can just look at the blockchain and see that you're the rightful owner. This way, blockchain makes buying and selling houses, or anything else, safer and more transparent. It's like having a superhero guarding your ownership rights, making sure no one can mess with them behind your back. So, while it might seem complex, blockchain is really just a smart way of keeping records that everyone can trust, without needing a middleman like a bank or government. It's a technology that could change how we handle all sorts of important information in the future. Beyond its application in cryptocurrencies, blockchain technology has the potential to revolutionize various industries and sectors. Some of the potential applications include 1. Supply chain management. Blockchain can enable more efficient and transparent tracking of goods throughout the supply chain, from production to distribution, enhancing accountability, and reducing the risk of fraud. 2. Healthcare. Blockchain technology can facilitate secure and interoperable sharing of medical records, improving patient care, and enabling more efficient research and development. 3. Real estate. Blockchain-based solutions can streamline property transactions, reduce paperwork, and increase transparency in property ownership and title transfers. 4. Voting systems. Blockchain technology can be used to create secure and transparent voting systems, ensuring the integrity of elections and reducing the potential for tampering or fraud. 5. Identity Management Decentralized identity solutions built on blockchain can give individuals more control over their personal data and reduce the risk of identity theft. These are just a few examples of the potential applications of blockchain technology. As the ecosystem evolves and matures, we can expect to see more innovative use cases emerge across various sectors. Smart Contracts and Decentralized Finance, DeFi One of the most significant developments in the blockchain space is the emergence of smart contracts and decentralized finance, DeFi. Smart contracts are self-executing contracts with the terms of the agreement directly written into code. 
they automatically enforce the rules and penalties around an agreement, eliminating the need for intermediaries and reducing the risk of fraud or arbitrary intervention. Ethereum, with its Turing complete programming language, has become the most popular platform for developing and deploying smart contracts. Decentralized finance, DeFi, builds upon the concept of smart contracts to create a new ecosystem of financial applications and services that operate on blockchain networks. DeFi aims to provide open, transparent, and permissionless access to financial services such as lending, borrowing, trading, and insurance without the need for traditional financial intermediaries. Some of the key advantages of DeFi include 1. Accessibility DeFi platforms are open to anyone with an internet connection, regardless of their location or financial status, promoting financial inclusion. 2. Transparency All transactions and contracts in DeFi are recorded on a public blockchain, ensuring transparency and accountability. 3. Composability DeFi applications can be easily integrated and combined to create new financial products and services, fostering innovation and experimentation. However, DeFi also comes with its own set of risks and challenges, such as smart contract vulnerabilities, liquidity risks, and the potential for flash loan attacks. As the DeFi space matures, addressing these risks and ensuring the security and stability of the ecosystem will be crucial. The potential of blockchain technology and its applications in smart contracts and DeFi represents a significant shift in how we think about trust, transparency, and financial services. As these technologies continue to evolve and gain adoption, they have the potential to reshape the financial landscape and create new opportunities for innovation and inclusion. Section 6. The Global Monetary Landscape In this section, we'll explore the global monetary landscape, focusing on the current state of global debt and how nations borrow and lend money. Global Debt Overview of Current Global Debt Levels Global Debt has reached unprecedented levels in recent years, raising concerns about the sustainability and stability of the world economy. According to the Institute of International Finance, IIF, global debt, which includes borrowings by governments, households, and businesses, reached a record high of $281 trillion in 2020, equivalent to 355% of global GDP. The COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated the debt situation, as governments have increased borrowing to fund economic stimulus packages, support healthcare systems, and mitigate the impact of lockdowns on businesses and individuals. In 2020 alone, global debt increased by $24 trillion, with government debt accounting for a significant portion of this increase. Some of the countries with the highest debt-to-GDP ratios include Japan, 266%, Sudan, 259%, Greece, 205%, and the United States, 133%. High levels of debt can have significant implications for economic growth, financial stability, and the ability of countries to respond to future crises. How nations borrow and lend money. Nations borrow and lend money through various channels, both domestically and internationally. Some of the main ways nations borrow include, one, issuing government bonds. Governments issue bonds, which are essentially IOUs, to borrow money from investors. These bonds can be short-term, such as treasury bills, or long-term, such as treasury notes and bonds, and pay interest to investors over the life of the bond. 2. Multilateral Lending Institutions Countries can borrow from international financial institutions such as the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, IMF, and regional development banks. These institutions provide loans, grants, and technical assistance to support economic development and financial stability. 3. Bilateral Lending Nations can also borrow directly from other countries through bilateral agreements. These loans can be tied to specific projects or economic objectives and may come with favorable terms or conditions. 4. Commercial Banks and Financial Markets Governments can also borrow from commercial banks and access international financial markets by issuing bonds in foreign currencies, such as U.S. dollar-denominated bonds. Nations also lend money to other countries and institutions through various means. 1. Foreign Exchange Reserves Countries with large foreign exchange reserves, such as China and Japan, can lend money to other nations by purchasing their government bonds or providing direct loans. 2. Sovereign Wealth Funds 
Some countries have sovereign wealth funds, which are state-owned investment funds that invest in various assets, including foreign government bonds and real estate. Three, participating in multilateral lending institutions. Nations can lend money indirectly by contributing to the capital of multilateral lending institutions like the World Bank and the IMF. The global debt landscape has important implications for the stability and growth of the world economy. High levels of debt can hamper economic growth, create financial vulnerabilities, and limit the ability of countries to respond to future shocks. Managing debt levels and ensuring sustainable borrowing and lending practices will be crucial challenges for governments and international institutions in the coming years. Cash versus digital money. Percentage of money that's actual cash versus digital. In today's increasingly digitized world, the vast majority of money exists in digital form rather than as physical cash. According to a 2020 report by the Bank for International Settlements, BIS, digital money, which includes bank deposits and other forms of electronic money, accounts for approximately 92% of the total money supply in the world's major economies. The exact percentage of cash versus digital money varies by country and region. For example, in Sweden, often considered one of the most cashless societies, only about 1% of the country's GDP is in circulation as cash. In contrast, countries like Japan and Germany have a higher reliance on cash, with cash in circulation accounting for around 20% and 10% of their respective GDPs. In the United States, the Federal Reserve estimates that cash in circulation amounts to about $2.05 trillion as of December 2020, while the total money supply, M2, is around $19.4 trillion. This means that cash accounts for roughly 10.6% of the total money supply, with the remaining 89.4% existing in digital form, increasing reliance on digital transactions. The shift towards digital money and cashless transactions has been accelerating in recent years, driven by factors such as technological advancements, changing consumer preferences, and government policies promoting financial inclusion and digitalization. The widespread adoption of smartphones, mobile banking apps, and digital payment platforms has made it easier and more convenient for people to conduct transactions without the need for physical cash. Services like Apple Pay, Google Pay, and Venmo have gained popularity, particularly among younger generations, for their ease of use and integration with everyday transactions. The COVID-19 pandemic has further accelerated the trend towards digital payments, as concerns about the potential transmission of the virus through cash have led more people to opt for contactless payment methods. Many businesses have also encouraged the use of digital payments to reduce the handling of cash and minimize contact between customers and employees. Governments and central banks around the world have been promoting the shift towards digital payments as a means of increasing financial inclusion, reducing the cost of cash management, and combating illicit activities such as money laundering and tax evasion. Some countries, such as Sweden and China, are actively exploring the potential of central bank digital currencies, CBDCs, as a way to further digitize their monetary systems. However, the increasing reliance on digital money also raises concerns about privacy, cybersecurity, and the potential for digital fraud. As more transactions move online, protecting sensitive financial data and ensuring the security of digital payment systems become critical challenges. Additionally, the shift towards digital money may have unintended consequences for certain groups, such as the elderly or those without access to reliable internet or mobile devices who may struggle to adapt to the new digital landscape. As the world continues to embrace digital money and cashless transactions, finding the right balance between the benefits of digitalization and the need to ensure inclusivity, privacy, and security will be an ongoing challenge for governments, financial institutions, and society as a whole. Section 7. Alternate Systems and Their Limitations In this section, we'll explore alternative economic systems and their limitations, focusing on bartering and its infeasibility in large, complex economies. Bartering Infeasibility in Large, Complex Economies Bartering is a system of exchange where goods or services are directly traded for other goods or services without the use of money. In a barter economy, people exchange things they have for things they need or want without relying on a common medium of exchange like currency. 
While bartering has been used throughout history and can still be found in some small scale or informal settings, it has significant limitations that make it impractical for large, complex economies. 1. Double coincidence of wants. For a barter transaction to occur, there must be a double coincidence of wants, meaning that each party must have something that the other wants and both must want what the other has. In a large economy with a wide variety of goods and services, finding this double coincidence of wants becomes increasingly difficult and time-consuming. 2. Lack of a common measure of value. In a barter system, there is no standard unit of account or common measure of value, making it challenging to determine the relative worth of different goods and services. This lack of a pricing mechanism makes it difficult to compare the value of different items, leading to inefficient exchanges and potential disputes. 3. Indivisibility of goods. Many goods are not easily divisible, which can make it difficult to exchange them for other items of equal value. For example, if someone has a cow but needs a pair of shoes, they may have trouble finding someone who has shoes and wants a whole cow in return. 4. Difficulty in storing wealth. In a barter economy, wealth is stored in the form of physical goods, which can be perishable, bulky, or difficult to transport. This makes it challenging for individuals to accumulate and store wealth over time, hindering investment and economic growth. 5. Limited specialization in trade. Barter economies tend to favor self-sufficiency and limit the scope for specialization in trade. Without a common medium of exchange, it becomes difficult for people to specialize in the production of specific goods or services and trade them for other items they need, leading to reduced efficiency and economic growth. In contrast, Money serves as a common medium of exchange, unit of account, and store of value, overcoming the limitations of bartering. By facilitating trade and specialization, money enables the development of large, complex economies with a wide range of goods and services. However, some alternative systems, such as local currencies and time banks, have emerged as attempts to address the limitations of both bartering and traditional monetary systems. Local currencies are alternative monetary systems that are designed to encourage local economic activity and community engagement. These currencies are typically pegged to the national currency, but can only be used within a specific geographic area. Examples include the Bristol Pound in the UK and Berkshires in Massachusetts, USA. Time banks, on the other hand, are systems where members exchange services based on time rather than money. One hour of service earns one time credit which can be used to purchase an hour of service from another member. The Ithaca Hours system in New York is a well-known example of a time bank. Benefits of local currencies and time banks include encouraging local spending and supporting small businesses, building community connections and social capital, providing an alternative to the mainstream monetary system, valuing skills and services that may be undervalued in the formal economy. However, these systems also face challenges such as limited acceptance and scalability. Difficulty in managing and administering the system. Potential for tax and regulatory issues. Dependence on a strong network of participants and community buy-in. While local currencies and time banks offer innovative alternatives to traditional monetary systems, they are unlikely to replace money in large, complex economies, Instead, they serve as complementary systems that can promote local resilience, community engagement, and social equity. Local currencies and time banks. Local currencies and time banks are alternative systems that aim to address some of the limitations of traditional monetary systems and promote local economic activity and community engagement. Two examples are the Bristol Pound and Ithaca Hours. Let's explore these two further. The Bristol Pound, launched in 2012 in Bristol, UK, is an example of a local currency. It is pegged to the British Pound Sterling and can be used to purchase goods and services from participating businesses in the Bristol area. The currency is available in both physical and digital forms, and it aims to encourage local spending, support independent businesses, and keep money circulating within the community. Ithaca Hours, established in 1991 in Ithaca, New York, is an example of a time bank. In this system, members exchange services based on time rather than money. One hour of service provided earns the member one Ithaca hour, which can then be used to purchase an hour of service from another member. This system values all hours equally, regardless of the type of service provided, 
Promoting equality and reciprocity within the community. Benefits and challenges. Local currencies and time banks offer several potential benefits to the communities they serve. One, encouraging local spending. By keeping money circulating within the community, local currencies can help support small businesses and stimulate the local economy. Two, building community connections. Participating in a local currency or time bank system can foster a sense of community and social capital as members engage in direct exchanges and build relationships with one another. Three, providing an alternative to the mainstream monetary system. These systems can offer a complementary or alternative means of exchange, particularly for those who may be underserved by traditional financial institutions. Four, valuing skills and services equally. Time banks, in particular, value all hours of service equally, regardless of the market value of the skills provided, promoting a more equitable and inclusive approach to exchange. However, local currencies and time banks also face several challenges. 1. Limited Acceptance and Scalability These systems often struggle to gain widespread acceptance and can be limited in their scalability due to their localized nature and the need for a critical mass of participants. 2. Management and Administration Running a local currency or time bank system requires significant organizational and administrative efforts, including managing accounts, ensuring transparency, and maintaining the trust of participants. 3. Tax and Regulatory Issues Alternative currency systems may face scrutiny from tax authorities and regulators as they can potentially be used for tax evasion or other illicit activities if not properly managed. 4. Dependence on Community Buy-in The success of local currencies and time banks relies heavily on the participation and commitment of community members. Without a strong network of participants and a shared sense of purpose, these systems may struggle to gain traction and sustain themselves over time. Despite these challenges, local currencies and time banks serve as innovative examples of alternative exchange systems that prioritize community, locality, and social equity. While they may not replace traditional monetary systems in large, complex economies, they can serve as valuable complementary tools for building resilient and engaged communities. As we navigate the limitations of traditional economic systems and seek more inclusive and sustainable alternatives, local currencies and time banks offer valuable insights and inspiration for rethinking the way we exchange value and build social capital in our communities. Section 8. Inflation and Deflation Inflation and deflation are two crucial economic concepts that have a significant impact on the purchasing power of money and the overall health of an economy. Definitions and Impact on the Economy Inflation Inflation refers to a sustained increase in the general price level of goods and services in an economy over time. When inflation occurs, each unit of currency buys fewer goods and services, effectively reducing the purchasing power of money. Inflation is often measured by the percentage change in the consumer price index, CPI, or a similar price index, deflation. Deflation is the opposite of inflation and occurs when there is a sustained decrease in the general price level of goods and services. During deflation, the purchasing power of money increases as each unit of currency can buy more goods and services. While this may seem beneficial at first glance, deflation can have negative effects on an economy as it may lead to decreased spending, lower economic growth, and higher unemployment. Causes and Consequences There are several types of inflation, each with different causes and consequences. 1. Demand Pull Inflation this type of inflation occurs when the aggregate demand for goods and services exceeds the aggregate supply. Factors that can increase demand include increased consumer spending, government spending, or investment. If supply cannot keep up with the increased demand, prices will rise, leading to inflation. 2. Cost Push Inflation Also known as supply shock inflation, this type of inflation occurs when there is a decrease in the aggregate supply of goods and services due to increased production costs. Factors that can lead to cost push inflation include rising raw material prices, higher wages, or supply chain disruptions. 3. Built-in Inflation 
This type of inflation results from expectations of future price increases. When workers anticipate higher prices, they may demand higher wages to maintain their purchasing power, which can lead to higher production costs and further price increases, creating a self-reinforcing cycle. Historical examples of extreme inflation and deflation include hyperinflation in Weimar, Germany, 1920s. After World War I, Germany experienced rapid inflation due to the government printing money to pay war debts and reparations. Prices doubled every few days, leading to severe economic and social consequences. Hyperinflation in Zimbabwe, late 2000s. Zimbabwe experienced one of the most severe cases of hyperinflation in history, with prices doubling every 24 hours at its peak. This led to the abandonment of the Zimbabwean dollar and the adoption of foreign currencies. Deflation in Japan, 1990s to 2000s. Following the burst of an asset price bubble in the early 1990s, Japan experienced a prolonged period of deflation, characterized by falling prices, reduced consumer spending, and slow economic growth. How Central Banks Control Inflation Central banks play a crucial role in managing inflation and maintaining price stability. They use various tools to control inflation, including 1. Interest rates Central banks set the short-term interest rates at which banks can borrow money. By raising interest rates, central banks can reduce the money supply and curb inflation. Conversely, lowering interest rates can stimulate borrowing and spending, potentially increasing inflation. 2. Open market operations Central banks buy and sell government securities in the open market to control the money supply. Buying securities increases the money supply, while selling securities decreases it. 3. Reserve requirements. Central banks set the minimum amount of reserves that banks must hold against their deposits. Increasing reserve requirements reduces the amount of money banks can lend, while decreasing requirements has the opposite effect. 4. Quantitative easing, QE. During times of economic stress or when interest rates are already low, central banks may engage in QE, which involves purchasing large amounts of government bonds or other securities to inject money into the economy. While QE can help stimulate economic growth, it can also lead to increased inflation, if not managed carefully. In summary, inflation and deflation are two key economic phenomena that can significantly impact the purchasing power of money and the overall health of an economy. Central banks use various tools to manage inflation and maintain price stability, aiming to promote sustainable economic growth and financial stability. Section 9. Wealth Inequality and the Distribution of Money Wealth inequality refers to the uneven distribution of financial assets among individuals or households within an economy. It is a critical issue that has gained increased attention in recent years due to its potential social, economic, and political consequences. Global Wealth Inequality The distribution of wealth varies significantly across countries and regions. Some nations have relatively high levels of wealth inequality, while others have more evenly distributed wealth. Differences in income and wealth distribution worldwide. 1. Developed countries. In many developed countries, such as the United States, United Kingdom, and Australia, wealth inequality has been increasing in recent decades. The top 1% of the population often holds a disproportionately large share of the country's wealth. 2. Developing countries. Wealth inequality is also prevalent in many developing countries, particularly in regions such as Latin America and Africa. In these countries, a small elite often controls a significant portion of the nation's wealth, while a large portion of the population lives in poverty. 3. Nordic countries. Some countries, particularly those in the Nordic region, for example Sweden, Norway, and Denmark, have lower levels of wealth inequality due to progressive taxation, strong social welfare systems, and a more equal distribution of opportunities. Statistical Data and Gini Coefficient Analysis The Gini coefficient is a common measure of wealth and income inequality. It ranges from 0 to 1, with 0 representing perfect equality. Everyone has the same wealth, and one representing perfect inequality. One person holds all the wealth. A higher Gini coefficient indicates greater inequality. According to the World Bank, the global Gini coefficient for wealth inequality was estimated to be around 0.804 in 2019. This suggests a high level of wealth concentration globally. 
Some examples of wealth inequality statistics include in the United States, as per the Federal Reserve data, the top 1% of households held 31.4% of the nation's wealth in 2019, while the bottom 50% held only 1.9%. As per the World Inequality Database in South Africa, one of the world's most unequal countries, the top 10% of the population held 86% of the nation's wealth in 2019, while the bottom 60% held only 1%. In Sweden, known for its relatively low inequality, the top 10% held 58% of the nation's wealth in 2019, while the bottom 50% held 6%. These statistics highlight the stark contrasts in wealth distribution across different countries and regions. Causes of wealth inequality. There are several factors that contribute to wealth inequality, including 1. Structural economic factors. Globalization, technological change, and the shift towards a knowledge-based economy have contributed to the concentration of wealth in the hands of skilled professionals and owners of capital. Two, historical legacies. Colonialism, slavery, and discriminatory policies have created long-lasting disparities in wealth and opportunities for certain groups. Three, tax policies. Regressive tax systems, tax loopholes, and low taxes on capital gains and inherited wealth can exacerbate wealth inequality. 4. Education and Skills Unequal access to quality education and training can perpetuate disparities in income and wealth. 5. Labor Market Dynamics Declining unionization rates, stagnant minimum wages, and the rise of part-time and gig work can contribute to income and wealth inequality. Addressing Wealth Inequality There are various policy proposals and initiatives aimed at reducing wealth inequality, including 1. Progressive taxation. Implementing higher tax rates on top incomes and wealth, closing tax loopholes, and strengthening estate and inheritance taxes. 2. Wealth taxes. Some economists propose taxing an individual's total wealth above a certain threshold to redistribute wealth and fund public services. 3. Universal basic income, UBI providing a guaranteed minimum income to all citizens to ensure a basic standard of living and reduce poverty. 4. Investing in education and skills development, ensuring equal access to quality education and training to promote social mobility and reduce disparities in income and wealth. 5. Promoting financial inclusion, expanding access to financial services such as banking and credit to help low-income individuals build wealth and participate in the economy. Addressing wealth inequality is a complex and multifaceted challenge that requires a combination of policy interventions, structural reforms, and social and cultural change. As global awareness of wealth inequality grows, there is increasing pressure on governments and institutions to take action to create a more inclusive and equitable economic system. Causes of Wealth Inequality Wealth inequality is a complex issue with multiple underlying causes, including structural economic factors, historical legacies, and policy choices. 1. Structural Economic Factors and Historical Legacies Globalization and technological change have led to a growing demand for skilled labor, increasing the wage premium for higher education and contributing to income and wealth disparities. The shift towards a knowledge-based economy has favored those with access to capital and high-level skills, leading to a concentration of wealth among a smaller group of individuals. Historical legacies, such as colonialism, slavery, and discriminatory policies, have created long-lasting disparities in wealth and opportunities for certain groups, perpetuating inequality across generations. 2. Effects of Tax Policies, Education, and Labor Markets Regressive tax systems, which place a higher burden on low-income earners relative to their income, can exacerbate wealth inequality. Tax loopholes and low taxes on capital gains and inherited wealth can further concentrate wealth among the already affluent. Unequal access to quality education and training can limit social mobility and perpetuate income and wealth disparities. Those with higher levels of education tend to have higher earnings potential and greater opportunities for wealth accumulation. Labor market dynamics, such as declining unionization rates, stagnant minimum wages, and the rise of part-time and gig work, 
can contribute to income and wealth inequality by limiting wage growth and job security for lower skilled workers. Addressing Wealth Inequality There are various policy proposals and initiatives aimed at reducing wealth inequality and promoting a more inclusive economy. 1. Proposals for Universal Basic Income UBI. UBI is a system in which all citizens receive a regular, unconditional sum of money from the government to cover basic living expenses. Proponents argue that UBI could help reduce poverty, provide a safety net for workers affected by automation and job displacement, and promote greater economic security and stability. However, critics raise concerns about the cost of implementing UBI, its potential impact on work incentives, and the need for complementary policies to address the root causes of inequality. Strategies for implementing UBI A. Phasing out welfare and social security. One approach to funding UBI is to gradually phase out existing welfare and social security programs, redirecting the funds towards a universal basic income. This could involve reducing the benefits provided under current programs while simultaneously increasing the UBI payment over time. Proponents argue that this approach would simplify the social safety net, reduce administrative costs, and ensure that all individuals receive a basic level of support regardless of their employment status or income level. B. Pro-rating Social Security Benefits Under this strategy, individuals would continue to pay into the Social Security system throughout their working lives, but upon retirement, their benefits would be pro-rated based on the number of years they contributed. The funds saved from reduced Social Security payouts could then be redirected towards funding UBI. This approach would ensure that those who have contributed to the Social Security system still receive some benefits in retirement, while also providing a basic income to all citizens. C. Negative Income Tax in NIT NIT is a closely related concept to UBI where individuals below a certain income threshold receive money from the government while those above the threshold pay taxes. The amount of money received or paid in taxes gradually decreases or increases as income rises, creating a smooth transition between receiving benefits and paying taxes. NIT could be implemented alongside a UBI, with the NIT serving as a means-tested supplement to ensure that low-income individuals receive additional support. D. Funding through new revenue sources. Another approach to funding UBI is to identify new revenue sources, such as a carbon tax, a financial transactions tax, or a tax on automation and artificial intelligence. These new revenue sources could help offset the costs of providing a basic income to all citizens without necessarily requiring the phasing out of existing welfare programs. However, implementing new taxes can be politically challenging and may face opposition from affected industries or interest groups. Implementing UBI would require significant changes to existing social welfare systems and would likely involve a gradual transition period. Policymakers would need to carefully consider the potential trade-offs and unintended consequences of different funding strategies, as well as the impact on work incentives, income distribution, and economic growth. Ultimately, the specific approach to implementing UBI will depend on the political, economic, and social context of each country or region. It is essential to engage in evidence-based policymaking, and multiple countries have been experimenting so we have enough data to pilot and evaluate different approaches to ensure that UBI achieves its intended goals of reducing poverty, promoting economic security, and fostering a more inclusive society. 2. Progressive Taxation and Wealth Taxes Progressive taxation involves applying higher tax rates to higher income brackets, ensuring that those with greater ability to pay contribute a larger share of their income. Wealth taxes, which tax an individual's total wealth above a certain threshold, have been proposed as a means of redistributing wealth and funding public services. However, implementing wealth taxes can be challenging due to difficulties in assessing the value of certain assets and the potential for capital flight to lower tax jurisdictions. 3. Policies Promoting Financial Inclusion 
Financial inclusion refers to ensuring that all individuals have access to useful and affordable financial products and services, such as banking, credit, and insurance. Policies that promote financial inclusion, such as expanding access to low-cost banking services, providing financial education, and supporting microcredit initiatives, can help low-income individuals build wealth and participate more fully in the economy. However, financial inclusion efforts must be accompanied by measures to protect consumers from predatory lending practices and ensure the stability of the financial system. Addressing wealth inequality requires a multi-pronged approach that combines progressive taxation, investments in education and skills development, labor market reforms, and policies that promote financial inclusion and economic security. Governments, businesses, and civil society organizations all have a role to play in creating a more equitable and inclusive economy. As the public discourse around wealth inequality continues to evolve, it is essential to consider the trade-offs and potential unintended consequences of different policy interventions. Ultimately, the goal should be to create a more just and sustainable economic system that provides opportunities for all individuals to thrive and share in the benefits of economic growth. Section 10, Behavioral Economics and Money Management. Behavioral economics is a field that combines insights from psychology, economics, and other social sciences to understand how people make financial decisions. By recognizing the role of psychological factors and cognitive biases in money management, individuals and policymakers can make more informed choices and develop strategies to promote better financial outcomes. Psychology of Money 1. Behavioral Biases Impacting Financial Decisions Loss Aversion People tend to feel the pain of a financial loss more intensely than the pleasure of an equivalent gain, leading them to make decisions that prioritize avoiding losses over maximizing gains. Example, an investor holds a stock that has lost 20% of its value. Despite evidence suggesting that the company's prospects are improving and that holding the stock could lead to long-term gains, the investor sells the stock to avoid further losses. In doing so, they prioritize avoiding additional short-term losses over the potential for long-term gains. Anchoring. Individuals often rely too heavily on the first piece of information they receive, the anchor, when making decisions, even if that information is not directly relevant or accurate. Example, a real estate investor is considering purchasing a property. The seller initially lists the property at $500,000, which becomes the anchor price. Even if market research and comparable properties suggest that the fair value of the property is closer to $450,000, the investor may struggle to negotiate a price significantly lower than the initial asking price due to the anchoring effect. Don't. Overconfidence. People may overestimate their ability to make accurate financial predictions or investment decisions, leading to excessive risk-taking or under-diversification. Example, a novice investor believes they have a unique ability to pick winning stocks based on limited research and market knowledge. They concentrate their portfolio in a few high-risk stocks, neglecting to diversify across different sectors and asset classes. This overconfidence in their investment skills exposes them to excessive risk and potentially significant losses. Mental accounting. Individuals tend to categorize and treat money differently based on its source or intended use, rather than considering their overall financial situation holistically. Example, an individual receives a $1,000 tax refund and treats it as bonus money, using it to splurge on a luxury item. However, they have outstanding credit card debt with a high interest rate. By mentally categorizing the tax refund as separate from their overall finances, they miss the opportunity to use the money to pay down their debt and improve their financial situation. Herd mentality. People may follow the financial behaviors of others, particularly during times of uncertainty, leading to market bubbles or collective investment mistakes. Example. During a market boom, many investors rush to buy a particular stock or cryptocurrency based on popular media coverage and social media buzz, even if they do not fully understand the underlying fundamentals or risks. As more people buy into the hype, the price continues to rise, creating a market bubble. When the bubble eventually bursts, many investors are left with significant losses. Two, how cognitive biases influence saving 
investing, and spending habits. Present Bias Individuals often prioritize short-term rewards over long-term benefits, making it difficult to save for the future or delay gratification. Example, a person receives a bonus at work and must choose between spending the money on a vacation now or investing it for retirement. Despite knowing that investing the money would provide greater long-term benefits, the individual chooses to spend the bonus on an immediate short-term reward, prioritizing present enjoyment over future financial security. Status quo bias. People tend to maintain their current financial habits or investment allocations, even when there may be more advantageous alternatives available. Example, an investor has held the same mix of stocks and bonds in their portfolio for years, despite changes in their financial goals, risk tolerance, and market conditions. Even when presented with evidence that adjusting their asset allocation could lead to better returns or lower risk, they maintain their current investment strategy simply because it is familiar and comfortable. Confirmation bias. Investors may seek out information that confirms their existing beliefs while disregarding contradictory evidence leading to suboptimal investment decisions. Example, an investor believes that a particular company is a good investment opportunity. They actively seek out news articles, analyst reports, and opinions that support their belief while ignoring or downplaying information that contradicts their view. As a result, they make a significant investment in the company, overlooking potential risks or weaknesses that a more objective analysis would have revealed. Framing Effect How financial information is presented, or framed, can significantly influence decision-making, even if the underlying facts remain the same. Example, a financial advisor presents two investment options to a client. Option A is framed as having a 60% chance of success, while option B is framed as having a 40% chance of failure. Although both options have the same statistical probability of success, the client is more likely to choose option A because it is framed positively, focusing on the potential for success rather than the risk of failure. Sunk cost fallacy. Individuals may continue to invest time, money, or resources into a losing venture or investment simply because they have already invested heavily in it. Example, an entrepreneur has invested a significant amount of time and money into developing a new product. After launching the product, they realize that it is not meeting sales expectations and is unlikely to be profitable. Instead of cutting their losses and moving on to other projects, the entrepreneur continues to invest additional resources into marketing and improving the product, hoping to recoup their initial investment, even though the chances of success are low. Personal Finance and Money Management 1. Importance of Budgeting and Emergency Funds Budgeting is crucial for managing income and expenses, ensuring that individuals live within their means and allocate their resources effectively. Emergency funds, typically covering three, six months of living expenses, provide a financial safety net in case of job loss, unexpected medical expenses, or other unforeseen events. 2. Basics of investing. Diversification. Spreading investments across different asset classes, for example, stocks, bonds, real estate, and sectors can help reduce risk and optimize long-term returns. Example. An investor constructs a portfolio consisting of a mix of stocks from various sectors, for example, technology, healthcare, energy, bonds with different maturities and credit ratings, for example, government bonds, corporate bonds, and real estate investment trusts. By spreading their investments across multiple asset classes and sectors, the investor reduces their exposure to any single company, industry, or market, thereby lowering the overall risk of their portfolio. Asset Allocation Determining the appropriate mix of investments based on an individual's risk tolerance, financial goals, and time horizon. Example, a 30-year-old investor with a high risk tolerance and a long-term investment horizon might choose an asset allocation of 80% stocks and 20% bonds. In contrast, a 60-year-old investor nearing retirement with a lower risk tolerance might opt for a more conservative allocation of 40% stocks and 60% bonds, each investor's asset allocation is tailored to their specific financial situation, goals, and risk profile. Rebalancing. Regularly adjusting the mix of assets in a portfolio to maintain the desired level of risk and return as market conditions change. 
Example, an investor starts with a target asset allocation of 60% stocks and 40% bonds. Over time, due to market fluctuations, the stock portion of their portfolio grows to 70%, while bonds make up only 30%. To maintain their desired level of risk and return, the investor rebalances their portfolio by selling some stocks and buying more bonds, bringing the allocation back to the original 60-40 split. 3. Retirement Planning and the Power of Compound Interest Start Early The earlier an individual begins saving and investing for retirement, the more time their money has to grow through compound interest. Example. Sarah starts investing $200 per month in a retirement account at age 25, while her friend David waits until age 35 to begin investing the same amount. Assuming an average annual return of 7% by age 65, Sarah will have accumulated approximately $559,000, while David will have only about $244,000. This difference highlights the power of compound interest and the significant advantage of starting to save and invest for retirement as early as possible. Employer-sponsored plans. Taking full advantage of employer-sponsored retirement plans, such as 401ks and pensions, can provide significant long-term benefits, particularly if the employer offers matching contributions. Example, Jennifer's employer offers a 401k plan with a 50% match on employee contributions up to 6% of their salary. Jennifer earns $60,000 per year and contributes the full 6%, which equals $3,600 annually. Her employer matches 50% of her contribution, adding an additional $1,800 to her retirement savings each year. By taking full advantage of her employer's matching contribution, Jennifer effectively receives an additional $1,800 in compensation annually, which can significantly boost her retirement savings over the long term. Diversification and Asset Allocation Applying the principles of diversification and asset allocation to retirement investments can help manage risk and optimize returns over the long term. Example. Michael is 40 years old and has a moderate risk tolerance. For his retirement portfolio, he chooses a diversified mix of investments consisting of 60% stocks and 40% bonds. Within the stock portion, he further diversifies by investing in a combination of domestic and international stocks from various sectors. For the bond portion, he selects a mix of government and corporate bonds with different maturities. By applying the principles of diversification and asset allocation to his retirement investments, Michael can potentially manage risk and optimize returns over the long term, increasing the likelihood of achieving his retirement goals. By understanding the psychology of money and the principles of personal finance, individuals can make more informed decisions about saving, investing, and spending. Recognizing and mitigating the impact of behavioral biases, developing sound budgeting and investment habits, and harnessing the power of compound interest can help individuals achieve their financial goals and build long-term wealth. Personal Finance and Money Management 1. Importance of Budgeting and Emergency Funds Tracking Expenses Keeping a detailed record of income and expenses helps individuals identify areas where they may be overspending and opportunities to save money. Setting Financial Goals a budget allows individuals to prioritize their financial goals, such as saving for a down payment on a house, paying off debt, or building an emergency fund. Emergency funds. Unexpected events, such as a job loss, medical emergency, or car repair, can strain an individual's finances. An emergency fund covering three, six months of living expenses provides a financial safety net and peace of mind. Example. Rachel creates a budget and realizes she's spending $300 per month on dining out. By reducing this expense to $100 per month and redirecting the remaining $200 to her emergency fund, she can build a financial cushion of $2,400 in just one year. 2. Basics of Investing Dollar Cost Averaging Investing a fixed amount of money at regular intervals, regardless of market conditions, can help mitigate the impact of short-term market fluctuations and reduce the risk of investing a large sum at the wrong time. Index funds. These are mutual funds, or ETFs, that aim to track the performance of a specific market index, such as the S&P 500. Index funds offer broad market exposure, low fees, and potential for long-term growth. 
bonds. Investing in bonds can provide a steady stream of income and help balance the risk of stock investments. Government bonds, corporate bonds, and municipal bonds are common types of bonds with varying levels of risk and return. Example, John sets up an automatic investment plan to invest 500 per month in a low-cost S&P 500 index fund. By consistently investing over time, he can take advantage of dollar cost averaging and potentially benefit from the long-term growth of the stock market. Three, retirement planning and the power of compound interest. Catch-up contributions. Individuals aged 50 and older can make additional catch-up contributions to their retirement accounts, such as 401ks and IRAs, allowing them to save more as they approach retirement. Roth IRA. A Roth IRA is a type of retirement account that allows individuals to contribute after-tax dollars. While contributions are not tax-deductible, qualified withdrawals in retirement are tax-free, providing a source of tax-free income. Rule of 72. This simple rule of thumb helps estimate how long it will take for an investment to double in value based on its annual rate of return. Divide 72 by the annual rate of return to approximate the number of years needed for the investment to double. Example, Emily, age 30, opens a Roth IRA and contributes $6,000 per year, the maximum allowed in 2021. Assuming an average annual return of 7%, her contributions will grow to approximately $1.1 million by age 65, providing her with a significant source of tax-free income in retirement. By focusing on budgeting, building an emergency fund, understanding the basics of investing, and harnessing the power of compound interest, individuals can work towards achieving their financial goals and building long-term wealth. These examples demonstrate how small changes in financial habits and a commitment to consistent investing can have a substantial impact on an individual's financial future. Section 11, Shadow Banking System. The shadow banking system refers to a network of financial institutions, instruments, and activities that operate outside the traditional regulated banking system. While shadow banking plays a significant role in providing liquidity and credit to the economy, it also poses potential risks and challenges for financial stability. Definition and Components 1. Financial institutions that operate outside traditional banking regulation. Shadow banks are not subject to the same regulatory oversight and capital requirements as traditional banks, allowing them to take on higher levels of risk. These institutions often engage in complex financial transactions and use financial engineering to create new investment products. Two, examples include hedge funds, money market funds, and structured investment vehicles. Hedge funds. These are private investment funds that pool capital from high net worth individuals and institutional investors. They employ various strategies, such as leverage trading and short selling, to generate returns. Money market funds. These funds invest in short-term, low-risk debt securities, such as treasury bills and commercial paper, offering investors a highly liquid, cash-like investment option. Structured Investment Vehicles, SIVs. These are off-balance sheet entities created by banks to invest in long-term assets, such as mortgage-backed securities, while funding themselves with short-term debt. Example. A hedge fund uses leverage to amplify its returns by borrowing money to invest in a diversified portfolio of stocks, bonds, and derivatives. By operating outside traditional banking regulations, the hedge fund can take on higher levels of risk in pursuit of higher returns. Risks and Benefits 1. Impact on Liquidity and Credit Creation Shadow banks can enhance liquidity in the financial system by providing alternative sources of funding and investment options. They can also expand access to credit for borrowers who may not qualify for traditional bank loans, such as small businesses and individuals with lower credit scores. 2. Potential Systemic Risks and Regulatory Challenges Interconnectedness Shadow banks are often interconnected with traditional banks and other financial institutions, which can amplify the transmission of risk during times of financial stress. Lack of Transparency the complex and opaque nature of some shadow banking activities can make it difficult for regulators to monitor and assess potential risks. 
Maturity and Liquidity Transformation Shadow banks often engage in maturity and liquidity transformation, borrowing short-term funds to invest in long-term, illiquid assets. This can create vulnerabilities if short-term funding dries up during a financial crisis. Example, during the 2008 global financial crisis, the collapse of the subprime mortgage market led to significant losses for many SIVs and other shadow banking entities. The interconnectedness of these entities with traditional banks contributed to the spread of the crisis throughout the financial system, highlighting the potential systemic risks posed by the shadow banking system. The shadow banking system has grown significantly in recent years, with estimates suggesting that it accounts for a substantial portion of global financial assets. While shadow banks can provide valuable services and enhance the efficiency of the financial system, their activities also pose challenges for regulators and policymakers seeking to maintain financial stability. Efforts to monitor and regulate the shadow banking system have increased in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis, with a focus on improving transparency, reducing systemic risk, and ensuring that shadow banks are subject to appropriate oversight. However, the rapidly evolving nature of the shadow banking system and the emergence of new financial technologies continue to present ongoing challenges for regulators and market participants alike. Section 12, Digital Currencies Beyond Bitcoin. While Bitcoin remains the most well-known and widely used cryptocurrency, the digital currency landscape has expanded significantly in recent years. Two notable developments are the emergence of stablecoins and the growing interest in central bank digital currencies, CBDCs. Stablecoins and central bank digital currencies, CBDCs. 1. Stablecoins pegged to fiat currencies. Stablecoins are cryptocurrencies designed to maintain a stable value relative to a specific asset, such as the US dollar or euro. Examples include Tether, USDT, and USD Coin, USDC, which are pegged to the US dollar on a 1.1 basis and backed by reserves of US dollars or dollar equivalent assets. Stablecoins aim to combine the benefits of cryptocurrencies, such as fast and cheap transactions, with the stability of traditional fiat currencies. Example, a global remittance company uses USDC to facilitate cross-border payments, allowing customers to send money instantly and at a lower cost compared to traditional wire transfers. The company holds USDC in reserve and converts it to the recipient's local currency upon withdrawal. 2. CBDCs, Concepts, Potential Benefits, and Risks CBDCs are digital currencies issued and backed by central banks, representing a digital form of a country's fiat currency. Potential benefits of CBDCs include increased financial inclusion, reduced transaction costs, improved monetary policy transmission, and enhanced cross-border payments. However, CBDCs also raise concerns about privacy, cybersecurity, and the potential disintermediation of commercial banks. Example, the People's Bank of China is piloting a digital yuan, also known as the eCNY, in several cities. The eCNY is designed to replace cash in circulation and provide a digital alternative for retail payments with the potential to enhance financial inclusion and reduce the cost of printing and handling physical currency. Regulation of Digital Currencies 1. Current Global Regulatory Landscape Regulatory approaches to digital currencies vary significantly across jurisdictions, ranging from outright bans to active encouragement and adoption. Some countries, such as Japan and Switzerland, have established licensing frameworks for cryptocurrency exchanges and service providers, while others, like China, have taken a more restrictive stance. International organizations, such as the Financial Action Task Force, FATF, have provided guidance on the regulation of virtual assets and virtual asset service providers, VASVPs, to combat money laundering and terrorist financing. Two, key challenges. Anti-Money Laundering, AML, and Consumer Protection The pseudonymous nature of many cryptocurrencies and the global reach of blockchain networks pose challenges for AML enforcement and the prevention of illicit activities. Regulators face the task of balancing the need for consumer protection and market integrity with the goal of fostering innovation and embracing the potential benefits of digital currencies.
Key areas of focus include implementing Know Your Customer, KYC, and AML requirements for cryptocurrency exchanges, addressing the risks of fraud and market manipulation, and ensuring the security of digital wallets and custodial services. Example. In the United States, the Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC, has taken enforcement actions against several initial coin offerings, ICOs, for violating securities laws, highlighting the need for clear regulatory guidance and oversight in the digital asset space. As the digital currency landscape continues to evolve, policymakers and regulators will need to adapt and develop frameworks that promote responsible innovation while mitigating risks. The emergence of stablecoins and CBDCs represents a significant shift in the nature of money and payments, with far-reaching implications for financial stability, monetary policy, and the role of central banks in the digital age. Section 13. The Way Forward As the global financial system continues to evolve and adapt to new technologies and changing societal needs, it is crucial to consider the potential future directions and challenges that lie ahead. In this section, we will explore some of the key trends and developments that are shaping the future of money and finance. Potential Future Directions 1. Central Bank Digital Currencies, CBDCs The growing interest in CBDCs among central banks worldwide suggests that they are likely to play an increasingly important role in the future of money. The implementation of CBDCs could lead to significant changes in the financial system, such as reduced reliance on cash, increased financial inclusion, and new opportunities for monetary policy implementation. However, the design and rollout of CBDCs will need to address challenges related to privacy, security, and the potential impact on the banking sector. Example. The European Central Bank, ECB, is actively exploring the possibility of issuing a digital euro. The ECB has conducted public consultations and is assessing the potential benefits and risks of a digital euro for the eurozone economy, with a decision on whether to move forward with the project expected in the coming years. 2. Financial Inclusion and Banking Access Advances in digital technologies and mobile connectivity have the potential to expand access to financial services for underserved and unbanked populations worldwide. The proliferation of mobile money platforms such as M-Pesa in Kenya has demonstrated the transformative impact of digital financial services in promoting financial inclusion and economic growth. Future efforts to promote financial inclusion will likely involve a combination of technological innovation, regulatory reforms, and public-private partnerships to address barriers to access and usage. Example. In India, the government has launched the John Don Yojana program, which aims to provide every household with access to a bank account, insurance, and credit facilities. The program has leveraged digital technologies and a network of bank agents to reach rural and underserved communities, resulting in the opening of over 400 million new bank accounts since its launch in 2014. 3. Decentralized Finance, DeFi, and its potential impact. The growth of DeFi applications and platforms built on blockchain technology has the potential to disrupt traditional financial intermediaries and create new models for financial services. DeFi solutions such as decentralized exchanges, lending platforms, and stablecoins could offer greater accessibility, transparency, and innovation in financial markets. However, the DeFi space also faces challenges related to scalability, security, and regulatory compliance, which will need to be addressed as the ecosystem matures. Example. Compound, a decentralized lending platform built on the Ethereum blockchain, allows users to lend and borrow cryptocurrencies without the need for a central intermediary. By automating the lending process and using smart contracts to enforce loan terms, Compound offers a glimpse into the potential future of decentralized finance. Navigating the evolving financial landscape. 1. Importance of financial literacy. As the financial landscape becomes more complex and digitalized, the importance of financial literacy and education will only continue to grow. Individuals and businesses will need to develop the knowledge and skills necessary to navigate new financial technologies, products, and services, and to make informed decisions about their money. 
Policymakers, educators, and financial institutions will need to collaborate to promote financial literacy and ensure that all segments of society can benefit from the opportunities presented by the evolving financial landscape. 2. Preparing for the changes ahead The future of money and finance will likely involve a mix of traditional and emerging technologies as well as new regulatory frameworks and economic models. To prepare for the changes ahead, Individuals and organizations will need to stay informed about the latest developments, be open to new ideas and approaches, and cultivate a mindset of lifelong learning and adaptability. Policymakers and regulators will need to strike a balance between fostering innovation and protecting consumers and the stability of the financial system, while also promoting inclusion and equity. Example, the COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated the adoption of digital payments and highlighted the importance of digital financial infrastructure. As a result, many governments and businesses are investing in the development of digital payment systems and financial technology solutions to prepare for the future of money and finance. The way forward for the global financial system will involve navigating a complex and rapidly evolving landscape shaped by technological innovation, changing consumer preferences, and new economic and social challenges. By embracing the potential of emerging technologies, promoting financial literacy and inclusion, and fostering a culture of innovation and collaboration, we can work towards a more efficient, equitable, and resilient financial future for all. Conclusion Throughout this episode, we have explored the fascinating history, mechanics, and future of money. From the early days of bartering to the rise of cryptocurrencies and digital currencies, money has undergone a remarkable evolution. We have seen how money serves as a medium of exchange, a unit of account, and a store of value, enabling complex economic systems and facilitating trade and commerce on a global scale. We have also examined the inner workings of modern banking and monetary systems, including the role of central banks, the impact of monetary policy, and the challenges posed by issues such as inflation, deflation, and wealth inequality. By understanding these concepts and their implications, we can make more informed decisions about our personal finances and navigate the complex world of money with greater confidence and clarity. As we look to the future, it is clear that money will continue to evolve and adapt to new technologies, changing societal needs, and shifting economic landscapes. The emergence of cryptocurrencies, stablecoins, and central bank digital currencies, CBDCs, represents a significant shift in the nature of money and raises important questions about the role of traditional financial institutions, the future of monetary policy, and the potential for greater financial inclusion and innovation. At the same time, the growing complexity and digitalization of the financial system underscore the importance of financial literacy and education. By empowering individuals with the knowledge and skills necessary to make informed financial decisions, we can work towards a more equitable and prosperous future for all. Money will continue to evolve, but understanding how it works today will help you navigate the financial tides of tomorrow. As we conclude this episode, we encourage you to embrace the opportunities and challenges presented by the evolving financial landscape. Stay curious, stay informed, and stay engaged in the conversation about the future of money. By doing so, you can position yourself to thrive in an increasingly complex and dynamic financial world. We hope that this episode has provided you with valuable insights and information about the past, present, and future of money. If you found this content helpful or thought-provoking, we encourage you to share it with your friends, family, and colleagues. By spreading the word and engaging in meaningful discussions about money and finance, we can collectively work towards a more informed, empowered, and financially literate society. We also welcome your feedback, questions, and additional insights. If you have any comments or suggestions for future episodes, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Your input is invaluable as we strive to create content that is relevant, informative, and accessible to all. Thank you for joining us on this journey through the fascinating world of money. Until next time, keep learning, keep growing, and keep navigating the financial tides of tomorrow. Sources for further research and citations. Federal Reserve System. Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System, 2021. The Federal Reserve System, Purposes and Functions. Cryptocurrency and Blockchain, Nakamoto S., 2008. Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. Mugayar W., 2016. 
the business blockchain, promise, practice, and application of the next internet technology, fractional reserve banking, Mishkin FS 2018, the economics of money, banking, and financial markets, Pearson Education, Global Debt, International Monetary Fund, 20 to 23, Global Debt Database, Additional Resources for Listeners, Books, The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel Money, The Unauthorized Biography by Felix Martin, The Ascent of Money, A Financial History of the World by Niall Ferguson, Podcasts, Planet Money by NPR, The Indicator from Planet Money by NPR, Money for the Rest of Us by J. David Stein. <laughs>